Good morning, CSUMB. All right. Wow, this is, oops, still on? Yeah. This is fantastic. I'm really excited to see all of you here and see the energy in the room and out in the hall. Just walking in, uh, I've never seen this place this, this energized. And uh, yeah, all right. I got to tell you, as far as I'm concerned, this is a success already. Just the interaction between you coming all together like this, it's really wonderful. So welcome, and I think we're in for a good, good day today. Well, I'm going to start uh, by trying to set the stage a little bit. Uh, today what we're going to do is look at the vision statement uh, with a view towards strategic planning and, uh, that will happen next semester. And uh, it's, a, it's a good opportunity as we approach the 25th uh, anniversary, the Silver Jubilee of CSUMB, to do this, to reflect on the vision statement deeply and to engage with it as a living document and to really do full justice to the ideas that are in it as we position ourselves and look forward to the next 25 years. So uh, prior to do that, let me, uh, I'd, I'd like to share with you what I've sort of uh, internalized as kind of the stylized facts of CSUMB's history in the first 25 years. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about that as I see it. As you know, history is a, is a very overwhelming reality. Uh, and uh, us humans have to create narratives that highlight certain facts, certain historical events over others to try to provide some sort of a narrative arc to what happens. And so I tried to do that for us as well to try to make sense of what's next for the institution. So I'm going to share with you my, my sort of elevator speech about CSUMB when I talk to donors about the institution and they want to know about it. Um, and also when I try to uh, argue for where we, I think we need to go next. So basically, it's got these three stages. Um, I see the, the institution as having gone through three phases. We're in the third phase right now. Uh, the foundational years, when it was first founded, uh, and you know, uh, those of you who've, who've been around for a long time know what a heady time that was. Uh, it was, uh, Peter Smith was president at the time. Uh, there was excitement, there was uh, innovation, there was improvisation. Uh, the plane was being built while you flew it. The campus only had six months to open, uh, a planning process that normally takes 10 years. Uh, and I understand the campus, unlike other CSU campuses that have done it in a more methodical way, opened up to both upper division and lower division students right off the bat. And I also heard, uh, I, recently I heard from some people who were part of that process um, in the community that the real reason this was done in such a short timeline was because there were rumblings in the Pentagon that the, that the Army wanted to take the base back, that they were sort of uh, having second thoughts. And that's, why the that's the reason why it opened so quickly, because uh, you needed to create some facts on the ground so that that wouldn't happen. So uh, the founding vision statement that was developed uh, I see it as I've uh, reflected on it and, and spoke with people, and, uh, and I was aware of the history of it too because I was in the CSU already when, uh, when CSU uh, MB opened and I, could, I watched the process unfold. And um, it really combines two sort of two elements in it. Um, there is uh, one element of it is really was driven by Chancellor Munitz. And this was uh, the idea that Muniz had that, wow, you know, we can start, we can create a, a different campus here um, for the 21st century, one that doesn't have to rely as much on bricks and mortar, but can take advantage of information technology and distance learning and all of that. Uh, and so for him, the rather dilapidated infrastructure that we were inheriting from the Army was really not a problem because IT and distance learning was going to make up for it. Uh, so that was one piece of it. The other piece of it is the one that was brought here by many of the faculty and staff that started the campus, which was the, for short, the social justice uh, vision. The idea that this institution could 
uh, serve the underserved communities of the Salinas Valley and really provide access to, um, to higher education at a level that hadn't been done before. Um, a lot of faculty came from the Bay Area and were already oriented in this, in this way. But uh, that, that idea of really creating a, an institution from scratch uh, really was a big piece uh, of the vision. Um, also, another piece, which is somewhat reflected in the statement itself, but more in the practice of the institution, is that uh, everybody wanted to try something new. People that tended to come here were a self-selected subset of academia that actually was excited about the prospect of coming to a brand new campus and trying things that were unencumbered by the past by legacy practices. So if you actually look at CSUMB, you'll find that just about every innovative practice in higher education as of 1994 got thrown into the pot. Um, so we have outcomes-based curriculum. We have service learning, learning communities. Uh, this campus, something that really struck me, developed uh, criteria for retention, tenure, and promotion based on Boyer's four scholarships, which was very much impacting higher ed at the time, at least at the discussion stage. Uh, many institutions or, that were you know, much longer lived uh, couldn't necessarily adapt to it, but it certainly was having an impact intellectually. And this campus actually embraced that and used that as the basis for its retention, uh, tenure, and promotion criteria. And the important thing about that particular item, which I'm very fond of, is the fact that Boyer developed this expanded notion of scholarship uh, where he basically said, you know, we need to think of scholarship more broadly and think of it not just as pure research, but also uh, uh, research of engagement, the research of integration, uh, and the scholarship of teaching. Those things uh, allow an institution to develop a more nuanced and broader conception of what kinds of research and scholarship is going to reward and incentivize for its faculty and therefore can tweak that, can, can sort of gauge the, the mix of scholarship to match the mission of the institution. And that's what CSUMB has done very well. One of the very powerful characteristics of this campus is that uh, its set of incentives as, uh, for faculty as embodied in that, in that document are perfectly aligned with the mission of the institution. And that makes it very powerful. But also, capstone projects and multidisciplinary programs, other, other features that were very much uh, in, in vogue at the time. So, so we started out you know, with this sort of bias toward change, toward innovation, toward doing things differently and, and welcoming change. And that's also another very powerful characteristic of our culture. So um, after 12 years, however, of that, pr of that process, some weaknesses became apparent in the institution. Um, the enrollment uh, was sagging. The curriculum was um, hard for uh, incoming students to understand. And in particular, transfer students were having uh, difficulty articulating uh, their work in community colleges with what we were doing here. Uh, we had learning outcomes. Uh, we had really internalize or embody the learning outcomes ideal so strongly that, as I understand it, the old general education curriculum really wasn't specifying courses as much as learning outcomes and therefore made it very, very difficult uh, to articulate. Um, and also because of that, um, ad hoc uh, beginnings of the campus and the fact that uh, the plane was being built while flown, uh, there hadn't been uh, adequate attention paid to developing policies and procedures that actually allowed the institution to, to function in a robust way. So these are some of the, the weaknesses that uh, the next um, period uh, when Diane Harrison came to the campus uh, faced. And so that, that phase of the 2006-2012 um, led to a number of, of um, actions uh, and uh, uh, foci for the institution, probably the most important one was the strategic decision to really be intentional about becoming a destination campus. That was a very important decision for the campus because a big reason why the enrollment was weak was because we are in a rural setting. Monterey County has less than half a million people. So there really wasn't enough of a uh, demand base for 
uh, higher education if we were just going to focus on the local communities exclusively. Um, and uh, so that was uh, coming to terms with that and recognizing that if CSUMB was going to continue to grow to the size that it needs to be in order to function effectively as a CSU campus, it was going to start to uh, have to attract students from across the state. So that was an important decision. And once you make that decision, a number of other things follow from that that have to happen to make it, to make it happen. Um, it meant that you were drawing students from outside the area, which meant typically they would not be coming part-time, but they would be full-time students since they wouldn't, they'd be too far away to commute. They'd have to come over and live either in the area or on campus. That meant that they would be traditional age, typically, and they would be primarily residential. So that, was, that flows directly out of the decision to become a destination campus. Uh, once you do that, you know, there's a set of needs um, and characteristics, needs that have to be met and characteristics that a campus has to have in order to attract that student body effectively. So improving the physical plant, making the campus physically more attractive, uh, developing co-curricular activities, providing student support services, because you're dealing now with 18-year-olds, 18 to 22-year-olds, 18 um, more than with working adults. So all those things, uh, I think during this period of time, the institution uh, proceeded to, to move on. Um, also, uh, the policies and procedures, the business practices will continue to be strengthened. Um, and um, things like uh, ad, uh, admissions, uh, outreach, uh, all of the business functions um, were, were developed and made more robust. And the last thing that happened just before I got here was that the GE curriculum was reformed and uh, made a little more conventional uh, so that it became easier for transfer students to articulate the work that they had been doing. And in fact, as soon as this curriculum came on board, there was a spike in transfers, transfer students. So it really did achieve that. So, um, so those are the things that happen. Uh, you could sort of put them, and, and there's, there was an interesting uh, goal in the strategic plan that was uh, developed during this time, which was explicitly as a goal becoming a comprehensive university. Um, so in some ways, I, I, I translate that to becoming more like a normal university in the sense that you know all of the standard character features uh, and attributes, uh, the basic blocking and tackling of the institution, if you will, to use a football metaphor, um, were, were being taken care of in this period. So, and that was a necessary, uh, I think, phase for the institution to go through. By 2012, when I arrived at CSUMB, we had strong statewide enrollment demand. You had uh, the transfer students' uh, numbers had risen. Business functions and policies and procedures were stronger. Campus life uh, was more developed. There were new facilities. You had Division II athletics, co-curricular activities, student support services. So the campus really, in many ways, had le reached a certain level of maturity. Um, and so at that time, what I told people was, this was great, it was necessary, but we, we don't want to keep, we don't want to define our direction indefinitely as becoming a comprehensive, becoming more of a comprehensive university because that's pretty generic. So if you keep doing that indefinitely, you become generic you. So it seemed to me that it was a good time to sort of pivot once again and focus on what makes CSUMB distinctive as an institution. What is it about us that is unique uh, and special? So that's what we've, uh, I, th I think we've been doing the last few years. Um, we started by refreshing the 10-year strategic plan. It gave, it gave me personally an opportunity to really learn about the institution quickly and, and provided a, a mechanism for people to reconnect. You may recall those of you who were here when, when I just got here that we went through a, a SWOT analysis, a strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats analysis with a fairly large group where we basically systematically looked at the institution, took stock of it internally, took stock of the environment we were in, and then having done that, took a fresh look at the strategic plan, ended up 
modifying it only slightly. We didn't dramatically change it, but we did a kind of a five-year refresh. Um, and I think um, also as a as a another sort of uh, thematic uh, gloss on it, um, I made the point that I thought that we should focus on in the coming few years in on on three things: on identifying and strengthening our distinctive programs here on campus um, by uh, three mechanisms uh, by. I, by recognizing uh, the regional industries that we serve and strengthening programs that support them, by capitalizing on our unique regional assets, and by supporting uh, any uh, other program that, for serendipitous reasons, was developing strength on our campus. So that's what we've been doing. We've been doing uh, ag business, um, ag science, hospitality management under the first sort of bullet. Uh, we, we continue to support marine science as a, a very natural program to, to, to be a distinctive program for this campus and take advantage of the Marine Bay, uh, the Monterey Bay uh, Marine Sanctuary. Um, and then there are other programs that are quite strong uh, that are uh, emerging uh, on their own right uh, just because of the, the, the uh, unique uh, mix uh, within the programs. I'm not going to mention them. They know who they are. I don't want to leave anybody out, so we'll leave that one <laughs> unstated. Um, and then uh, the other thing that I, I remember when I first got here, I, I sort of threw a challenge out there uh, to the campus uh, because, as you, you might recall, I, I came directly from Washington after serving in the Obama administration and the Department of Education. And I was really concerned about the fact that the U.S. really uh, was uh, in a very uh, in a great bind because just as uh, we need to substantially increase the uh, the proportion of our population that has uh, post-secondary education and college degrees, we were also losing capacity to uh, produce graduates by the disinvestment in higher education that was taking place at the state level across the country. So uh, one, one partial response to that is to uh, try to re to transform and reinvent how we deliver uh, higher education by using new pedagogies and, and new technologies. And so I put that out as a challenge and I told the campus I thought I thought we were in a unique position to contribute to this to make a national contribution because you know we have, as I mentioned, I mentioned two of these great characteristics we have um, a culture that's open to innovation and change. We have a set of incentives that is perfectly aligned with the mission of the institution. And the third thing that we have that is another huge asset for us is a very powerful vision statement. So with those three elements, uh, you know, the institution has a capacity to perform, I think, that is outstanding. And I thought we could do something in this area. And lo and behold, uh, it wasn't too long before um, I was made an honest person by the campus. Uh, because uh, we ended up creating two programs, we may recall, that uh, were awarded by the governor in an innovation competition statewide. We, we, it, you may recall the governor had, I think it was $16 million. Um, and, um, uh, or was it $50 million? $50 million, yes. Um, and, um, there were, uh, it was open to all individual uh, campuses, uh, public universities in, the, in, in California of the three systems. And uh, there were close to 50 applicants and uh, about 16 awards, I think. We got, we got, we were the only institution that got two awards, okay? So uh, since then, I have been telling uh, everybody that I meet about, about CSUMB being the most innovative public university in California. <laughs> so, so, and I think you know the the, pre, the the governor the governor said so. So, um, so these are some of the things that we've been uh, we've done. The CS and three and the math huge were the two programs that got the awards. Um, uh, but we've been doing some other things that are pretty uh, pretty innovative as well. The, we are developing, continue to develop two plus two programs with our community college partners. Uh, the graduation initiative is another one that even though we didn't initiate that, uh, we are excelling at it. We were the only university 
the only campus I think that got like a, a green light on all three measures that they're keeping track of. So we're like the star pupil right now in the chancellor's office. Yes. <laughs> And I think we're making very good progress in um, campus-wide assessment, um, uh, looking at uh, the overall educational outcomes of our baccalaureate and, uh, and identifying institutional learning outcomes. So these are some of the things we've been doing. Uh, and the third thing that I, I, I challenge us to do is to really become intentional um, and focus on, on becoming a regional steward. Um, and I think we're, uh, we're, we're making progress there in a couple of ways, uh, many others too. We have always been a, a, a key player in the region uh, through our service learning program with tens of thousands of hours of service, public service. But now we're actually uh, be, you know, taking uh, that to the next level by becoming uh, a leader as an institution uh, in initiatives like Bright Futures, the Cradle to Career Educational Partnership with K-12 and other stakeholders. Uh, and also with the Monterey Bay Economic Partnership, uh, which is also taking a regional you know, strategic view at how to develop the region in a way that preserves uh, our values and also provides opportunities uh, for, for good jobs for, for our young people. And FORA, uh, the Fort Ord Reuse Authority, is uh, an, uh, an organization which in some ways lost its way a little bit um, during the recession, where every commu every municipality scrambled for revenues and lost sight of the fact that the whole point of this fora uh, agency and the Fort Order Use Plan was to develop a regional, uh, holistic approach to to development. So we we helped there by creating the regional uh, economic development uh, symposium, where people came. It was primarily aimed at the board members to really develop a common knowledge base and understanding of what it takes to do regional economic development and how municipalities can't just make their own development plans in isolation of each other, because uh, that just doesn't work. So now we are approaching a, our Silver Jubilee, as I said earlier, and um, we have successfully extended our presence in the region. We have three new facilities there, made quite a splash when we uh, landed on these three spots, first by acquiring a uh, Ryan Ranch facility, then by um, acquiring the, uh, the Steinbeck Center's building, uh, which we now call CSUMB at Salina City Center. And we have a great program now going there under the leadership of Enid Rice and the, the Center for Arts and Culture that is also really making an impact and showing the community what, what it means for CSUMB to make a real commitment to Salinas uh, and Salinas Valley. And North Salinas is also uh, the former Heald College, uh, sort of a, a, a facility that is basically turnkey ready to, to start uh, instruction and it's going to house programs that uh, draw primarily commuter students uh, and therefore tap a, a broader segment of the population with our, with our programs. We have impacted, I think, the uh, educational pipeline uh, of Monterey County through uh, bright futures, but also by partnering with Hardnell and MPC in a way that um, you know took it to the next level. And um, the industries of the region, I think, are more connected with us with the programs that we've developed in the School of Business, College of Business, and also in the College of Health Sciences. Uh, programs like the Physicians Assistance Program is is getting uh, support from all of the major healthcare institutions in this area. And so really uh, we're developing the notion that we are the, the Monterey Bay's uh, institution, uh, lead institution that helps the region move forward. Uh, and that uh, has led to increasing private support to us and has brought it to the point where we are now in fact in a silent phase of a campaign that um, will, I think, really allow us to come out and, and uh, be recognized as, as having reached that next level of maturity. And this is all sort of culminating with our Silver Jubilee, where I think we'll, you know, around that 25th anniversary, we will make a splash with the campaign exactly whether it's launched, whether it's completed or something or in between, it will be uh, definitely tied to that 
and help reset the, the, the mindset of everybody in the, uh, in the region about CSUMB. Um, we've also, um, as, as we get to this 25th anniversary, we have we had the dialogue on um, Boyer's Four Scholarships that is uh, <clears throat> provided a basis for uh, the subsequent uh, review of uh, our RTP criteria to make sure that they continue to work effectively uh, to provide the, the correct set of uh, incentives and rewards for our, um, for our faculty. Um, we have, uh, and here's where I bring Michael, um, Michael Scott, our Academic Senate Chair, to talk a little bit about this. He can do it better than I can. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. So again, my name is Michael Scott. I'm the Chair of the Academic Senate and I sort of provide a faculty perspective and we really focus on the academic mission. Um, first of all, I want to I want to thank the president for getting, uh, making this event happen. I'm looking forward to talking to my colleagues about the vision statement, especially my non-faculty colleagues. Um, when we, so to mention the Boyer's, the RTP policy that's based on the Boyer's four areas of scholarship, one thing that, um, or let me back up, when, we, when I was thinking about this event, I was really sort of reflecting upon you know, my role or my interface or faculty's interface with the vision. And as chair of a search committee last year, we always talk, you know, the RTP policy always um, comes up and we always talk about how our vision embeds the RTP policy. This was also going on, uh, we're in the middle of a WASC reaccreditation or reaccreditation re process and we've been thinking a lot about um, what what makes our university distinctive and unique, and also um, what is the meaning of our degree, and the RTP policy came up again there, and I think that's one of the really strong points where it really embeds the mission and values as um, uh, described in the vision statement. Also, um, the other as chair of the assessment committee back in 2014, we started creating for the first time institutional wide learning outcomes. And in that process, we spent a great deal of time aligning what we wanted every CSUM, CSUMB graduate to learn and how that aligned with our vision statement or how aligned with our, our values and our mission. And I think that really exemplifies um, where it was the institutional learning outcomes really embeds those ideals. Um, and to see where we're going with that, we, for the first time we have campus-wide assessment to see you know, where are our students going or what, to measure how our students are meeting those outcomes. And lastly, as also we th I think about the vision I'm thinking about um, what it means for student success. How can we, um, I don't know how to say this, but how do we sort of embed the values that are listed in the vision? You also may have heard of a couple executive orders, 1100 and 1110. So this conversation about how do we align those curricular changes in this short amount of time um, with the mission and values in our vision statement and as we talked about the founding of the university in that six short six month period, it really feels like we're starting all, all of this again in uh, 25 years later, where we're exact, uh, asked to do a great deal of work that would normally take many years in a short amount of time in six months. And that's what I wanted to have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Okay. All right. So, um, so that's that sort of finishes the first s stage of this presentation, where I kind of set the stage of the, uh, the leading up to the moment we're in now. So, next, uh, as we as, as our current strategic plan uh, finishes this cycle, and we approach the 25th anniversary of the campus, 
we're going to do a, a, a new round of strategic planning. And it seemed like a very, as I mentioned earlier, it seemed like a very fitting time to really re-engage with the vision statement. The vision statement is uh, a very powerful document, uh, so powerful that in some ways it's a little bit intimidating in terms of, you know, how do you actually um, break it down, sift through it, how do you make distinctions between the different kinds of concepts that are in there, as opposed to being some, you know, uh, artistic whole that absolutely cannot be in any way improved or touched or anything like that. Um, well, as a matter of fact, we're not going to, well, I, and, I, and I know that some people were worried that, you know, we were going to change it. And actually, that's not the issue. The issue is to re-engage with it and as, as a living document that can, that can substantively inform what we do uh, from here on out. So uh, that's what we're going to do today. And, and this process, for, uh, I'm going to be giving you a little more briefing on the context of it, but eventually we will get to the point, you know, I'll, I'll share with you some strategic planning concepts that we, we need, some terms of art that we need to use in the process, and how those uh, connect to the vision statement. We'll parse through the content of the vision statement, and, uh, and you'll be doing that in your uh, breakout discussions. And we will then uh, gather from you input for the strategic planning committee. Uh, so uh, as far as how the vision statement can inform that process. And then the plan will be developed next term. So uh, to start with some of the strategic planning concepts that um, I wanted to share with you, um, and you know, a number of faculty, particularly in the College of Business, but in other places too, are familiar with this. But please bear with me for the sake of everybody sharing the same uh, set of uh, concepts. Uh, in strategic planning, you have, first of all, mission. The mission of an institution is why we exist. What are we here to do? Uh, what, what is our purpose as, a, as an organization? Uh, in strategic planning, the word vision is used in a, in, a more, in a technical, more narrow sense than the word is used in the vision statement. The, our, vision, our campus vision statement is more than a vision in the strategic planning sense of the term. And in strategic planning, vision simply means what we want the institution to become in some, at some point in the future. What are we aspiring to become as an institution? That's our vision. What is our vision of CSUMB? Um, oops. There. OK. Then the next term to keep in mind is values. That one is pretty self-explanatory. Every, every institution has a, a culture. Every organization has a culture that, that, that has embody certain values and and that sort of those values kind of uh, f determine how we go about doing our business how do we interact with each other how we how we think about what we do it's all those ethical and personal and professional characteristics that that sort of define who we are and how how we do what we do and then goals that's that's the first thing that we said. The broadest uh, outcomes that we strive for are our goals. And by the way, I should say, in strategic planning, uh, as is uh, done um, across organizations, the first three terms are pretty well and tightly defined the way I have. From here, from goals on down, sometimes it varies a little bit, depending on the variant uh, of, of the organization. They may use these terms slightly differently. but it helps for us to agree to use them this way for our purposes. So goals would be the major uh, objectives that we have identified as the way that we're going to accomplish our mission for the next planning cycle. The strategies are going to be what strategies we're going to adopt to accomplish those goals. You know, we're, gonna, we're going to uh, improve our graduation rates by, for example, improving advising. That would be a strategy. Uh, and tactics are more fine-grained ways in which we are going to actually execute those strategies. So if we're going to improve advising for students, specifically what are, are we going to do 
to, so that we get that general uh, stress statement because we we are accomplishing our mission, <clears throat> but our values are how we do that. So values sort of feed into the mission of the institution. The institution's culture means that we move forward and work to accomplish our mission in a particular way, consistent with our values. There's also a couple of other things that feed into the mission uh, and the institution, and that's um, the, the, the two um, ovals uh, feeding into mission there. One is the external environment, because uh, we are not uh, operating in a vacuum. We are one institution in a region. We are part of a system. Uh, we are part of the United States. The world is at a particular co-juncture right now. All those things are part of the external environment that impact how we uh, have to think about uh, accomplishing our mission. And the other oval is internal resources. Uh, so we, we're facing an environment that constrains what we can do, and we have a mission, and what we can do is then, uh, and what we can control is, is the internal resources. How are we equipped to be able to accomplish our mission given this external environment, given the values that we, uh, we embody. And so <clears throat> that uh, means basically the physical infrastructure, the human uh, resources that we have, everything that the institution has inside is the internal resources. So um, given all that, uh, given uh, our taking stock internally and taking stock externally and given our values and given our mission, we can then articulate where we hope to be in a number of years. So the vision flows out of that. And out of that vision, basically the vision says, okay, we're at point A, we'd like to be at point B. Um, and so how do we get to point B from point A? We set some goals. So the goals flow out of that, and then we set strategies. And then the strategies get uh, executed through tactical plans that could be annual, um, but it's certainly uh, w at least within one strategic planning cycle. And that feeds then into the strategies feed into that box on the right, which is the tactical planning, that the annual planning that we do. And the thing about those plans, that's where you finally get into uh, delivering and, and getting results. And those results then are going to lead to outcomes that you know accomplish our goals, but also are going to uh, hopefully enhance our internal resources. So we get better, stronger at what we do. And that's why those plans feed back into the internal resource oval. And after uh, five years of the planning cycle, when we do this again, the internal resources will be stronger, larger, better. OK. Now, just as a point of reference, uh, the California State University itself, a system, has a mission statement. It looks like this. It's pretty big. It's, a, it's longer than the ideal one. But it does, uh, if you look at this, it's fairly, um, it's fairly on point, especially if you just take a few of these. For example, the very first one is the broadest m sense of the mission of the CSU, to advance and extend knowledge, learning, and culture, especially throughout California. That, pretty much encompasses it. And then it gets down to uh, little sort of takes on that a larger mission. Uh, finally, by the fifth bullet, it gets to the nitty gritty, well, the reason why we're here, to offer undergraduate and graduate instruction leading to bachelor's and higher degrees in the sciences, the fields, uh, applied fields and professions, et cetera. And a few other things there as well. Um, but uh, if, if, if the mission had stopped there, it would be a little, a little large, but pretty much on track. But it's actually, it goes on. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but I, and to, to, to give some credit to the CSU, they did take this part of the mission and put a different header on it. It's like a part two of the mission. Or it says, to accomplish its mission over time and under changing conditions, the CSU, and then they list a bunch of um, strategies and tactics and goals. Uh, so even though they, they, they list this as part of the mission statement, it really isn't the mission statement. It's more like an inventory of goals, strategies, and tactics you can use to advance the mission, which is the first part of the statement. 
So in some sense, it, they, they have sort of uh, handled it adequately, conceptually speaking. So now the, the, the vision statement for uh, CSUMB, and I'm, gonna, and I'm referring it to here as the founding vision statement to distinguish it from the vision that we use in strategic planning. As I've, I think I've said already, it, it is a, a very thorough and visionary, indeed, uh, founding document. It is long, 710 words. And it has elements of a vision for what the CSU MB campus will become. It has, um, uh, it, it talks about what, what we exist to do, so there's mission elements there. Uh, there are references to values that guide our work. Uh, it identifies goals that we achieve. In fact, it also uh, mentions strategies uh, because it has addresses ways in which we organize ourselves. And they even talk at times about specific tools and techniques that we're using. So it gets, it gets down into tactics at times. So really the founding vision statement is a founding document that, that paints a complete picture for the, for the CSUMB that has all of those elements. It has elements of mission, of vision, of values, of goals, strategies, and even tactics. Now, as, as we described these terms before in terms of how they function relative to one another, I think one thing that becomes apparent is that some of these are longer lasting than others. Some of these are more permanent features of the institution and some are more, you know, they change uh, more frequently. Um, and so, and that's true, that I think is true of the, uh, the vision statement also. Um, but today what we are, um, going to do is, uh, you know, we want your input into all of those elements for our strategic plan uh, that we're going to develop next term. But I wanted uh, us to do it first by, you know, reaffirming that we're staying true to the core of what CSUMB is. And the way to do that is to do it, in, you know, uh, in a way that connects organically to the vision statement, to the founding vision statement of the institution. But to do that appropriately and not become enthralled or, or you know, inhibited in our thinking by the vision statement itself because it's so powerful. It helps to unpack it, to actually recognize that some elements of it are the longer lasting foundational ones, uh, mission and vision and values, and some of them are more um, time bound, more contingent, goals, strategies, tactics. So that's what we are gonna do today. And to get the ball rolling, you have in your packet um, uh, several um, documents. The first one is a document that actually took a stab at uh, pulling out of the vision statement for the campus uh, the elements that address mission, vision, values, goals, strategies, and tactics. So that's already grouped. Um, and the question is obviously, is this the right grouping? Are, have, we un, have we parsed the vision statement in the right way by, by taking the pieces of it and putting it in these buckets, if you will? Um, to show you how we did this in context, the next one is a color-coded table which shows the founding vision statement on the left column, and then it shows, it. it color codes uh, certain phrases and then moves them over to the right column in terms of mission, vision, values, goal, strategies, and tactics. So that this one tells you how we did it, but the other one is probably the one that's easier to work with once we get down to actually uh, analyzing the various components they are already grouped here in a narrative form. And then it, for better context yet, we also included a straight uh, narrative version of the vision statement. And I, again, I, I'm labeling it founding vision statement provisionally to distinguish it from vision as used in strategic planning. So there's the six categories. And so um, we're gonna do two breakout sessions today. In the first breakout session, um, 
all of our tables here are going to focus on mission, because that is the most fundamental um, uh, element for the institution. Um, so we're going to ask you to consider three questions. One is, uh, in that document where we pulled out s some fragments of the founding vision statement and put it under mission, the ones that are under mission, are those the right ones? Did we pull the right components out? Uh, are there some that need to be added that were not put in there that are, that are in your view, our mission, uh, address our mission? Uh, are some that, are already, that were put in there not mission related, but maybe related to one of the other categories, uh, vision values or, or, or some of the goal strategies or tactics? So that's the first question. So add or subtract from, from that um, uh, out of the, uh, the overall founding vision statement. Um, and then uh, of the ones, once we uh, agree that these are the, the elements that belong under the heading mission from our vision statement, the next question is, OK, uh, are all of these continue to be relevant to us? Is this still a correct? This is the substance of your of your feedback here. You know, is this are these elements of mission that are present in the vision statement still ruling today? Should they be to continue to guide us in, in our in our mission as an institution? Um, and the third one is: Are there some elements to the mission of CSUMB as you have come to understand it that don't show up in the founding vision statement that need to be added out of somewhere else, not in the vision state. So those are the three questions that we're going to ask you to talk about. And each of your tables, uh, will uh, we're going to ask you to, uh, to um, um, self-select uh, a facilitator uh, for the conversation and a recorder and take notes on that. Because there's a lot of us here, we won't be able to get to uh, reporting from all the tables. We will have a, re a reporting session to the whole group after we're done with the discussions, but it will be selective just to get a sense of, of how the, some of the conversations have gone. But the real systematic uh, feedback mechanism will be the notes. So it's very important that you take notes of your discussions because we will collect those and, and compile them uh, and provide them to the Strategic Planning Committee um, for, uh, as sort of the community input into this process. OK. And so now I'm going to turn to our provost, Bonnie Irwin, who is going to give you some more details about the logistics of the breakout sessions. All right. Thank you. All right, as the president said, um, we're going to ask that each table appoint, elect, voluntold, however you want to do it, someone to facilitate. And the facilitator, your job is twofold. One is to make sure that anyone who wants to speak gets the opportunity to speak. You try to make sure that no one or two people are dominating the conversation. And keep the time. On your agenda, you'll notice that this is supposed to go until 1045, so make sure we fit into that time space. The secretary or recorder at each table is another self-appointed, however you want to do it, if you want to draw straws, whatever. Um, we have given you some paper for this, and we are going to ask that each recorder actually use this paper and that you put your name on it. The only reason we're asking for a name is so that when we start compiling these later, if there's something we can't read, we may be knocking on your door. We, you know, we went through all the different ways of doing this. Should we use laptops? Should we do it? And we decided, you know, basic pen and paper. We're going old school. Um, may not be the most sustainable thing in the world, but we think it will be very helpful. So, um, facilitators, timekeeping, spread the talk around the table recorders, put your name on, and take notes of the high point. When we do the uh, breakouts, we'll be picking on some of the tables, and then we'll try to pick some other ones this afternoon. 
And then after we do the breakouts this morning, we'll talk a little bit more about logistics this afternoon. It was also recommended to me that since we have in this room about 400 matching pad folios, that everyone may want to put their name or a business card or something in it so that at the end of the day, um, you walk out with yours and not someone else's. So um, just a, a friendly suggestion. We have purposely organized these tables so that no one's probably sitting with a direct supervisor. If you may notice, we pulled the cabinet out of this entirely. We will be circulating, but we did not want to have a, either a chilling effect or people expecting us to answer all the questions kind of impact on this. So we're going to be wandering the room, but this is for us to hear from you. So be honest, be open, be frank, and have a good time. Thanks. I'll keep it to one whole, was that we added, uh, when we were talking about the service, um, serving the diverse people of California, we felt also that this institution is designed and is in place to serve the historically underrepresented and underserved in the Tri-County area, and we felt that was an important piece to put in. Ronnie. Hi, I'm Allie Lynch. Um, I'm from the Mathematics and Statistics Department, and I'm representing Table 14. Um, we also, that was what I was going to say, so that was one of the things that we discussed as well. Um, another thing that we discussed is we felt like of the components that were pulled out for the mission, there wasn't really a mention of the student, the student that we serve and why we serve them and what's the purpose of what we do. And so we felt that student, perhaps in the quote, student and society-centered should appear also in the mission. Hi everyone, my name is Kenny Garcia. Yeah, can you all hear me okay? Yeah, okay. So um, we uh, talked about adding a, f a few terms throughout the mission, um, adding a, a global engagement or a global perspective. Um, there was a little bit of contention around whether to include values as part of the mission or separating values and mission, um, uh, there was, you know, uh, kind of thinking about values as informing the mission versus values, uh, mission informing the values. Um, and one more thing was um, uh, thinking about rephrasing the term comprehensive. Um, I know we, we kind of use the word regional in our discussions, um, but that comprehensive um, might not have the we it might not have the same definition across the different audiences that are reading the uh, mission statement. Just as a little point of information, uh, the word comprehensive is uh, drawn from the Carnegie classification scheme. And so it's sort of a term of art, and you're right, it's rather an opaque term for outside audiences, so uh, I think that's a point well taken. And just as an FYI, comprehensive basically means universities that offer a wide variety of programs at both the bachelor's and the master's levels. Typically, they don't do uh, doctoral or you know, research-oriented, heavy research. So, yeah. Ronnie. So we too struggled with the comprehensive as it relates to people not in the academy. Um, we also thought that rather than just serving the diverse, we thought serving and supporting the diverse people, and in particular around supporting our students. Um, we also discussed whether or not there needs to be verbiage in the mission about it being a transformative experience for our students. We also thought that maybe adding social justice into the mission, since it is core to what we do, that it might be a part of our mission and not just a goal or a strategy that we employ to achieve our mission. <laughs> uh, 
And that pretty much everything else has been covered. Okay. Morning. Good morning. I'm representing Table 26. And um, we want to um, build on what our um, co-table brought up around global perspectives and global context. Um, we agree that most of the content of the mission elements of the vision statement um, are there and are good. However, one gap that we talked about extensively is about our mission uh, representing global context and global perspectives, that we are here definitely to serve the diverse people of California and to contribute to the economies of our state, um, the well-being of our local communities, but we encourage ourselves and each other to think about these, who we serve from that global perspective. Our students and our communities are made up of peoples from many different countries. We have a large immigrant population in our state and we serve them as well. And to serve them well, we need to have that global perspective in what we do, in what we teach, um, and how we serve our students. And we just felt like the mission was a little bit too California-centric, and that we need to weave in those elements of um, our global communities that we represent and that we serve, and that our students ultimately will contribute to and serve in the future. We uh, spent quite a bit of time discussing the way that service had been separated from high quality education in the analysis and felt that as one phrase, service through uh, high quality education was much more provocative and innovative as a mission statement. Uh, there was a desire to include staff consistently with the language students and faculty in the mission statement. Uh, there was also a desire to clarify the fundamental role that community partners play in the vision, in, the vision, in addition to talking about the way that we address community needs, uh, a desire to include language about assessing community needs in addition to meeting community needs, and also, um, adding in language about high academic standards um, in tandem with serving our students' needs. Hi, everybody. Dan Fernandez, representing Table 24. And uh, we had a, an excellent discussion um, on these topics. And the topic of California came up. Is it just the people of California? So I think that that's a theme I keep hearing. And we had it as well. Um, as well as the idea of including non-degree programs in mentioning them because they're becoming a much larger piece than they were when we started, such as extended ed programs, uh, um, let's see, for, for instance, and there's, there's plenty of others, the Cambridge program, several others were, were mentioned as well. In addition, um, Focusing also on in the other cohorts of students, such as international students, students that come from outside of the state of California, and better connecting the vision to uh, our current reach and where we want to go as a campus. And uh, in, terms of, in terms of pieces that weren't in there, um, adding more uh, of, of, a dis of a statement about the social, economic, and environmental, the three-legged stool, all of those pieces go together. There's not a lot of mention of that. We have some big environmental issues coming up, and we thought that really should be high and central to what we're proposing using the university. And uh, to mention something the business school will probably say too, also adding responsibility into that. So kind of a four-legged stool of things that we want to have our students thinking about and all of us thinking about. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm Steve from IT, and at our table, we uh, had a few observations. First, um, the term, especially the working class and historically undereducated and low-income populations, didn't seem to make it from left to right, and we think that it should have. Um, we're at least a second table to pile on where we'd like to see some language regarding social justice. 
and um, we had a few things we thought might um, be considered for moves from one category to another. One is increased access and quality learning moved to mission. One is recognized as the importance of global interdependence, also moved to mission. Service, we think, is more of a value than a vision. Um, the value and uh, cultivate creative and productive talents of students, faculty, and staff, we think that's more of a strategy than um, uh, where it is now. And then commitment to equity and access should be a goal, maybe. Uh, finally, uh, the term distance learning seems a little maybe older to some of us at our table. Maybe we could consider what that term re really means today. And lastly, um, perhaps a tactic might be some language around student debt awareness because that's a real reality t today. So that's it. Thank you. Yeah. Miguel Lopez at table 11. Um, I wanted to start with the, the point that some people have made and articulate it this way. I think sometimes we separate values from mission and sometimes they're in both categories and we want to kind of make certain that that's not lost as this process gets moved forward. And we really wanted to start with that. What, what are the visions that are going to create this mission rather than starting with the mission statement? We found ourselves finding it difficult to just jump straight into the mission. And so not wanting that process to get lost as the work from today moves forward to the strategic planning group. Um, we're going to raise potentially a controversial issue in terms of international students. I agree that we have a global population here. If the mission is to serve the diverse people of California, how do we keep that as a particular focus of the CSU as part of the CSU mission statement as part of our pushback to the legislature and the larger government structure, the master plan of higher ed, um, so that it doesn't become an us versus them, but is there a focus there on that? And then the other is also one of the strengths that we think in terms of service learning, for instance, is not just serving the community, but learning from the community. And how do we make certain that that is not a unidirectional, but a bi-directional kind of focus in terms of things? Thank you. Let me, let me just uh, make one short comment here about the international student aspect. Um, I agree, um, and I thought about making it earlier when the emphasis on globalization was raised. Uh, we are a state university. We, have, we are part of the CSU. And part of the state, the California State University's mission is to serve Californians. So that is our primary mission. Uh, however, in doing so, bringing in students from out of state and from other countries enriches the educational experience for all of our students, number one. Number two, this campus, in order to better serve Californians, needs to reach critical mass. And given the constraints on funding right now, you know, that's an environmental constraint, right? But on the internal resources side, what can we do with the inside that can control, what can we do to, that we control to be able to counteract that external environmental constraint? And growing an international student population, an out-of-state student population, because they they pay full cost, helps scale up the university, helps support some of the overhead infrastructure um, services that all students benefit from, as well as enrich the educational experience. So for all those reasons, I think, uh, and staying within the guidelines that CSU has given us to limit international students to 10% of the student body, uh, this is something that is kind of a win-win because we serve those students. Certainly, we, 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 we care about their educational outcomes and we serve them. It helps uh, support our students locally and it helps us achieve the, the, the efficient scale that we need to be able to better serve all of our students. So, yes. Hello, I'm Kristen Vega from Table 37. It's a good group. Uh, and so uh, that is a direct uh, introduction to what we really discussed, um, thinking globally but acting locally. And I, we think it's a, a yes and situation. You can serve the people of California and do so with a very um, global perspective because oftentimes we are overwhelmed by where do we begin? Here. 
in the Tri-County area, but we're also thinking very globally. Um, and we also discussed a lot about this idea of sustainability, uh, both for planet and for people. So something that was in the PowerPoint was the uh, student success ecosystem. And I, uh, we keep going back to ecosystem of what it means for all of these pieces to really uh, work together and thrive. And so something, I don't know, I, I come from a sociological perspective, and I'm sure that ecosystem means something very different for those who come from more of a, um, a like a natural science perspective. But I think there's definitely overlap there that um, we can explore to make us a comprehensive but not a generic university. Thank you. From table number six, um, we underscore a lot of what has been stated before, particularly about the diversity, serving underserved communities, opening it up beyond California, even though we understand the, the particular uh, state mandates. But to think globally and incorporate that, that's where we could be innovative with our teaching and still reach a global uh, understanding and awareness for our students and impact it in the best way possible. Uh, there is one thing that has not been mentioned so far that we talked a little bit about, and that's the inclusion primarily in the arts and cultural focus. In the beginning, I was here, and we did have uh, a lot of arts and cultural discussions. It was supposed to also be multi-platform to cross over di disciplines and divisions. Uh, that has seemed to be lessened over the years, and not just because I'm an arts proponent, but the ability of the arts to help students understand a lot of the concepts of social justice, equity, and how their learning creates a positive aspect to the world is especially enhanced and uh, helped by an arts awareness, if not education directly. And I, th you know, we uh, felt that that should perhaps be more you know, be reintroduced and emphasized in the mission statement and in the appropriate tactics and so forth. And uh, uh, just stronger language and applaud everything that's going on. Thank you. Perry, Shireen, you're presenting table 39. Uh, we had a lot of fruitful discussion at our table. Um, one of the things that we discussed was while we agreed with the components that were identified in the mission, we believe that maybe they were too generic and that they should reflect what makes CSUMB distinctive, such as um, our service learning, foreign language, interdisciplinariness, partnerships, community, ethical approach, social justice, um, but that in general it should reflect CSUMB as, as opposed to being generic statements. Uh, good. Thank you. On. Okay, get it close. Uh, Alyssa Erickson, and a lot of what we discussed has already been brought up. And one of the first things that we discussed was the first thing brought up was to really add in working class and historically underrepresented and low income populations, that it really is the reason we exist and it belongs in the mission, but that we would change undereducated to underrepresented um, and include that as, as our language. Um, and then we would add staff, and then the fifth bullet point on the mission, some of it's a little redundant with the fourth about the economy. Um, and then the other thing we would add in, let me go through my papers here, is the last part of the vision statement. It really reads like a mission. I think this was put into goals. So. Uh, to meet critical state and regional needs and to provide California with responsible and creative leadership for the global 21st century as, as, as part of what we do or why we do it. Um, and then what we take out of the vision, this is so small, but we wouldn't have year-round operation because it's now a reality and not our vision. So it's small, but that's what we take out. Oh, and then we'd add in, that's not um, some um, from the vision, is that we'd add gender and racial equity um, because it needs to be addressed for what we're doing. Thank you. Um, this is table 30, and I want to, I'm Susie Worcester, I want to share, um, I think a lot of ours builds on what other people said, so I just want to reiterate that the uh, diverse peoples of California needed to include specifically low um, um, 
low income first generation and it needs to be specific. Um, and had many people said that. We also had sustainability, we felt fit in the mission under like wellness, because that's sustainability, personal, financial, and ecological, environmental. Um, that was all those things fit together. Um, um, we had similar things about um, uniqueness or distinctiveness to make sure we keep our distinctiveness. Um, and that we, um, a tradition we had before was blending lines between administration, staff, faculty, and students, and having all those voices at the table, and that that was really important across different elements of the mission. Um, and we had, got a little gum. The 21st century, we spent a lot of time on that. A lot of people at half the table thought that it was really important to stick with 21st century, and others felt that that dated us, and we just need to say forward thinking into the next century. And that was a, a long discussion. Is there anything else that I? Anything else that I, did I hit? Okay. Thank you, Sue. Thank you. So, I, again, Michael Scott representing um, table number 22. A lot of the elements that we talked about were mentioned already. Um, we really wanted to add to the specific pieces of the mission statement around the working class and historically under, um, to representative and low income populations, and that we also wanted to, um, we wanted also to add the commitment to the multilingual, multicultural, and gender equitable learning as part of the mission. Um, I forget, I think that was in our values before. We wanted to add that. And then, we didn't want to take anything out of the current bullet points of the mission, but we did want to add some things in with the mission question number three. Again, um, this was mentioned before, in addition to serving the diverse people of California, we also wanted to add in um, those folks with the out-of-state students and international students. And then um, we also, this was sort of mentioned before too, um, equip CSUMB alumni students with competitive job market and, and job seeking skills as to support them after they graduate. And then again, educating um, under supported students um, and how they enter post secondary education and really focusing on supporting the educational goals of the regional needs. And I think it wasn't written explicitly here, but it was also the two-way where they inform us and we inform them. So it's this sort of two-way exchange of information. <laughs> Hello, my name is Ashley McCallan. I work for the financial aid office. Um, for ours, we thought um, for bullet number four, <laughs> the, contri the contribution to the economy of the state, we thought that should actually be regional, state, um, country, and global community. So really break it down into each um, aspect. And then we also thought the end of it, the quality of development for students, faculty, and service areas, we thought that actually that should be changed more as a goal. Um, and instead of service areas, staff, we thought would be important for us. Thank you. Hello. Uh, hello, Mary Lou Shockley, representing table 40. It's a great table, by the way. Um, just a, a few things. Uh, I'd like to uh, reinforce the notion of uh, global competency, uh, which needs to be in the mission itself. Also, one thing that uh, was shared at this table is that only 2% of our students ever go abroad. So having students come to this campus is extremely important. If we want to give them a personal feel of what it's like to inter, uh, interact with yet other people with other ideas about their own culture. And I think that's really, really a critical value from a pedagogical standpoint, which is, which is I think, important to our students. The other thing that I think we touched on but did not really get into was what happens after graduation. And I think uh, one of the tables did touch on this. But uh, I think we need to do more about uh, career, uh, post-graduation, uh, and progression. And uh, we need to emphasize the notion of alums and their connections as, as, as once an otter, always an otter, as far as I'm concerned. So these things have to be reinforced. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ronnie. 
Hi, my name is Kim Judson. I'm from the Collaborative Health and Human Services program, a faculty member, and um, many of the items that were mentioned we discussed. Nice to hear this common uh, understanding. Can you hold your mic a little closer? Um, the please? area that we focused on, um, one of the areas we focused on that is different is uh, modeling inclusive, non-hierarchical, healthy relationships. We have staff here from different um, departments, uh, administrative staff, staff who deal with relationship issues on campus as well as housing and faculty. And there, there's mention of inclusivity and belief and respect for various um, groups on campus, but this idea of uh, expanding wellness to include social relationships and that we model that. So I've been here 20 years, the idea of a flatter organization where there's not only an expectation of differences between administrative groups, between administration and faculty, different faculty groups, but that there's a mutual respect and inclusivity and we model that as an institution. Because as we become more like a generic comprehensive university, what will have us stand out in relation to students seeing a modeled, inclusive and mutually respectful um, organizational structure? So that was our question. Thank you. Morning. Hey, I'm representing Table 41, which I'm going to have to trump all of you on, sorry about that, um, and say um, we have the best table. Sorry, none of you live up to this. I apologize. Um, we, we would say that we concur with pretty much everybody who's already spoken. Um, and we, in particular, with service, with adding a focus on the global and global competence in particular. And one of the things that came up here was that there are some spaces for us to improve how we've phrased things. Um, a little focus on the word choice, undereducated came up in, in particular, without losing the spirit. There was also a concern that um, realizing what missions tend to be like. Um, mission statement here is a little generic, which certainly doesn't fit our spirit. Uh, and uh, so we would encourage a little bit of thought as to the things that have come up already, which again, we concur with, how can those be shaped into the mission in a way that makes our spirit a little bit more clear? Thank you. Hi, I'm James, representing Table 18 and the awesome people of Student Housing. It's OK to clap there. We're really cool. <clears throat> so really, we're all kind of hitting the same notes um, as everyone else, um, being service-minded, you know, producing service-minded students, producing globally-minded students. You know, we're all hitting the same thing. So the one thing that we, um, we wanted to tweak to make it more specific to our area was for the uh, last point of mission, instead of emphasize those topics most central to the local area, just very generic, um, changing it to something along the lines of highlight the riches of the Central Coast from agriculture to technology and its diverse people groups. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Antonio and I am also representing Table 8, but student housing as well. So there we go. First things first, we would wholeheartedly retweet many of the points that have already been made, so thank you all for stating such good thoughts. Uh, outside of that, in terms of some of the things that we would add to the mission statement as it stands, is first and foremost trying to talk about the vitality of the university, but also the campus and our community. And we said that we would try to highlight that by going and working through, thank you, <laughs> and also working, in, working to include and better reflect the first thought that came from the actual CSU mission statement for the system, and that spoke to advancing and extending knowledge and also the culture. So part of what we talked about as far as our group is discussing both different components such as the affordability and also the value that we have here at CSUMB in terms of our education trying to highlight the research components that are already included and or taking place in our actual classes and the curriculum here. And then the last piece was also highlighting some of the different things that make us unique. So not trying to just say that we're innovative, but showing it in our mission statement, whether it is some of the statements that were just made and talking about the actual Tri-County region. So thank you. Hi, 
Hi, I'm Nick Rodriguez with the IT department. Um, and I'm here at table 19, uh, also wonderful people. <laughs> um, so one of the first things we were talking about was um, for the second point of the mission statement um, points was we thought it might make more sense to say something like high quality education for innovative world um, because we really liked um, the statement that talked about, um, sorry, something in the future, but I can't find the word <laughs> very quickly. <laughs> and we thought innovative would really show part of what we're about more than just a general education, high quality education. Um, and to that point, we also thought that we should try to fit in something along the lines of uh, the word distinctive, because we saw that as another table did as well. And we think that really keys into what CSUMB is about, is about being distinctive and offering something different for our students and community. Um, and we also liked um, uh, moving the mission statement, or the, the currently under vision, multicultural, uh, gender equitable, inter intergenerational, and accessible residential learning environment to a uh, mission statement, because it's something we'd we'd like to do now compared to hoping to do in the future and that we want to focus on as a community and you know to support California and our and all the people here and the last point that we had was um, focusing on the empowerment of our students and staff faculty um, everyone else that has to do with CSUMB because we feel like we're really empowering people to become who they want to be, to empower their education, to control their education, to just empower them across their lives and, and who they become. So, thank you. Good morning, everybody. My name is Matthew Scott McClooney. I'm with Campus Planning and Development. Can I get any love from Campus Planning? <laughs> All right. And a great table five. Um, we talked about and support just about everything that's been said already as well, um, but particularly want to make sure that sustainability was included. Um, it's, it, uh, it itself can be defined in a lot of different ways, and Dan, I think, did a good job of unpacking it with the three stool, um, but there's a lot of different ways to define that, but it's important. Uh, I think that makes us unique as well. Um, we talked a lot about diversity and how we should define it for today and moving forward because when it was originally used, it had some different focuses than it probably does have for today. So we thought that was very important. Um, we talked about balancing how the university as an institution is to serve California versus having a mission to create leaders who serve California um, and just how to balance that uh, dynamic. Um, and then a uh, last point to bring up is how do we as a university, as a CSU, complement the community colleges and the UCs um, as systems that all work together in California? Hi, Kimmy Crossman at Table 20. Um, a lot of what we talked about has already been covered in the session, so I'll highlight some of the commonalities um, from our table across the other tables. Um, we talked some about um, using language that would better represent and characterize our communities and the students um, that we have here at the university, um, and to um, include that we contribute not only to the social environment in positive ways, but also the natural environment and incorporating sustainability into that. Um, and last, that we contribute, um, broadening that we contribute to the economy of the state, um, actually narrowing it um, to describe ways that we contribute to the economy of the region and this tri-county, tri-county, tri-county communities. Hello, everybody. I'm Sheree Carvalho, and I'm from University Personnel. And I have the worst table. It's horrible. <laughs> but we did come up with some things. So anyways. OK. So uh, we just want to echo that there were a lot of things that folks um, also mentioned. And we were right in line with that. There were three areas that we probably came up with something that's a little bit different. Um, it's relative to the word of comprehensive. <clears throat> like what, is, what does comprehensive mean? Appreciate that. 
presidential. However, we had some other thoughts. Um, <laughs> so uh, a, a comprehensive university might look, uh, have the use of technology, might have the integration of disciplines. Here's one, all departments functioning in an equitable way. Students engaged in the process of being a university and varied access to education. So that's what we thought comprehensive might look like. The other thing is to expand diversity to include veterans, disabled, as well as differently abled and low income students, faculty and staff. We'd like it to be affordable relative to the high quality and similarly to others, locally focused and globally minded. Good morning, everyone. My name is Maria Seham with the, in admissions. And a lot of the points that will have been already been covered by the rest of the people, but some of the uh, other areas that we just want to highlight or just add to um, is focusing on outcome-based education, some of the points that are already in the and the vision and the mission. Also focusing on diverse communities and what that really means to make sure that um, that continues to be there. And making campus a cultural hub for the community. So somebody already mentioned the arts and everything, so making that a stronger component of our campus. And just to reiterate what somebody else mentioned is linking the alumni to and the workforce. What are we preparing our students for? Um, and how are we preparing them to enter the workforce as of, um, to make sure that they can be um, contributing to the community as well and the workforce. Hi, my name is Channing. I'm representing table three. And we talked a lot about um, things that have already been discussed. So one thing that is a little bit different and adding on to some of the areas that have been discussed. Um, we talked a little bit about adding something about social justice, but we weren't sure if that was exactly what we were thinking about. So we suggested adding potentially the word liberal to the phrase high quality education. So it'd be a high quality liberal education. Um, and that would be the, the purpose of that would be flagging our commitment to education that prepares students to be civically engaged, democratic agents, open minded individuals. Um, so just uh, potentially thinking about that wording. And we also thought about including something about the holistic approach, um, so teaching the whole student. So those are just a couple of additions that we had. Bobby Quinone is representing table 25. Just table 25, we'll leave the... Uh, we support what's currently in the vision statement, but there is a need to develop and elaborate elements from the mission statement to vision, values, goals, strategies, and tactics. So seeing everything linear, so how we can achieve those missions, uh, especially with diversity service, uh, the K-12 pipeline improving access, uh, especially in the Tri-County area, um, the importance of staff, affordable housing, and um, also alum alumni engagement, not just preparation for the workforce, but as the vice president of the Alumni Association Board of Directors, good plug, uh, we're great people doing great things. We need to stay engaged, and uh, we want to do so. Thanks. Hi, I'm Julie Altman, representing Table 2. Um, we had a great conversation in our group. One of the things we focused on was um, how to distinguish between regional, state, um, global, and where those focus foci should be, and to say, um, uh, to emphasize that we should do what we say we are, or say uh, what we do, uh, and to make that consistent. Um, we also talked a lot about the social justice term and how it is not equivalent to social responsibility um, and that social justice should definitely um, pop out somewhere in our mission statement. Um, we also struggled with how temporal a lot of the elements in the <clears throat> vision statement were. Some things seemed very outdated, very 1995-ish. Some things seemed um, to be missing. Um, and we realized how hard it is to make all the elements relevant and universal across time, though we hoped that that would be something that could emerge. 
Um, we also questioned who is the vision statement really written for? Who's the audience? Um, and can it be really for all purposes? We talked about the many people who look at it. Um, we also wondered why so many important things were not color coded at all. And we spent a fair amount of time focusing on some of the more qualitative elements um, in the mission uh, statement that were interesting to us, like what is a substantive commitment? Um, what is it to mean to be motivated to excel and things like that? We also finally talked quite a bit about um, the theme of crossing institutional boundaries, and we wanted to thank the university's commitment to this uh, experience today, making sure that was happening, and hope to see this um, experienced more in the future. Uh, let me just chime in here with one short comment about the mission statement and what the audience for a mission statement is. Mission statement should be uh, the one thing that all of us across the university know we exist to do. So regardless of what you, whether you work you know, on buildings and grounds or in finance or faculty or student affairs, whatever it is that we do, we, we all know that we're part of this ongoing enterprise to do X. That's our mission. That's, that's what it should be. It also should be short enough, ideally, that we can put it in the back of our business card. So that, you know, if somebody says, well, oh, you're at CSUMB, what's CSUMB all about? What do you guys do? Pop it out. <laughs> OK. Oh, OK. Hi, I'm Enid Rice. I'm from the most troubling and challenging table. Number three, I'm just kidding. <laughs> They're awesome. They also want you to know that they are the bomb. Um, they, we talked about um, having more, uh, putting, moving service to underrepresented students up to the mission. I'm just saying it again because I feel like if a lot of people say it, then it'll happen. Um, so we said that. We said it a lot. Um, and then we said um, putting service, you know, the word service under vision, um, specifically talking about, I mean, under mission, uh, talking about service learning. Um, the topics most central, let's see. Uh, well, I think talking about the bullet point number four seemed to get simultaneously more specific and vague at the same time, which was a feat. But we were wondering if that could be more clarified. Um, defining comprehensive university. Um, and, is, and is that what we want to be? Or do we want to focus more on distinctive um, strengths? Um, and we wanted to put underserved students in anywhere it says diverse people of California. Um, and uh, we wondered if multicultural, multilingual, gender equitable uh, learning should be up in the mission. There was discussion about the need for alumni connection and, and talking about that. We also talked about um, in high quality education bullet point, uh, mentioning that we do give degrees um, and that we develop expertise. Um, that's very important. And it was really wonderful to have this conversation um, with, with so many staff members at the table who have such great perspective to offer. Thank you. Hi, my name is Malia Arshad, and I'm from the College of Business, and I'm representing Table 9. Um, a lot of what we talked about has already been touched on by most of you, so I kind of wanted to expand on the importance of it. We really wanted to see um, CSUMB distinctive and student-centric language in the mission statement. Um, you know, what we talked about is that a mission statement should be specific to your university, so when I read it, I should know that this is talking about CSUMB. Um, and while we want to keep it brief, I think it, you know, it is important to highlight that if CSUMB's initial motivation was to help the underserved communities, uh, that's definitely something that should be highlighted in it. Um, we also did take issue with the use of undereducated, um, because those who are in undereducated communities are in underserved communities, so there's reasons why they're undereducated. And I think using the term like underrepresented or underserved, uh, yeah, underserved um, highlights that there's more going on rather than just a lack of education. Um, and another thing that I, a lot of you touched on was social justice, and it came up a lot in our discussions. And I think that we really have a lot to learn from the universities in this area, especially since our environment and uh, the general Bay Area 
has so many socially and politically involved youth. Um, so UC Berkeley, Stanford, they've all had great success at uh, really fostering that environment and making sure that students are able to take on their own community and, their own, and kind of build this own social movement within the universities and facilitating that. Thank you. Okay, folks, we have uh, time for two more. Two more, okay. Hi, my name is Lacey Rock. I am from Lucky Table Number 36. Um, we also had a lot of the similar conversations that came up with some of the other tables. Um, and I'll just highlight three things um, in the interest of time and brevity. One is to really connect the mission to the values. We sort of struggled with, you know, the, the values maybe need to be refined, but really deliberately connecting our mission to our values. Um, and then approaching student learning as the whole person. I think this came up at at least one other table, really looking holistically at that student and how they're learning. Um, and then preparing engaged global citizens. Um, this, I think, has come up a little bit as well, but really looking at our students as um, going out into the world and engaging in their communities and their surroundings. Um, service to the community, sustainability came up. Um, as well as sort of moving around some of the values to the mission, such as culture of innovation, multilingual, multicultural, gender equity, learning. Also, we talked about integrating into the mission. Hi, I'm Cindy. I'm with table 13, and we're all kind of quiet here, but can you guys hear me? Okay. <laughs> Um, we're all a little bit quiet here, but I'm with table 13, and there's, we agree with everything that you've already said, but there's one really important word that I want to say, and I want to add it to um, bullet number, number two, high quality accessible education, so that that would benefit all students, including those with disabilities. Thank you. All right. So... That's been wonderful. Thank you very much for all of that feedback. It's, it's great to hear it. Uh, it's great to see many of the similar uh, notes and themes emerging. And uh, if your group didn't get to report, don't worry. We are collecting the information, and we will compile it and make it available to the Strategic Planning Committee um, to, uh, as input from the entire community. Uh, we are... Um, I'll tell you more about the Strategic Planning Committee later in the day. But now, uh, let me um, focus on the logistics for when we return from lunch. We're going to go to lunch, which is in a different part of the complex. We're going to go to, go to the uh, building over there, right? <laughs> there will be people to guide you to lunch. OK. <laughs> All right. So. Uh, when you come back, you're going to be in your breakout session that's not determined by a number, but by a topic. When you says breakout in your, in your tag, in your name tag, it says breakout and it says either mission, vision, values, or, well, not mission, but vision, values, strategy. Yes, Bonnie, am I wrong? I get, your number is still significant. Ah, okay. All right. So, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll, I'll get into the weeds here. Um, after lunch, those of you doing vision and values will come back to this room. But you will find that your two rows of tables are right there together. So I would suggest that the values folks may want to move back and occupy the tables across the back so that you have a little bit more sound buffer among you. You will, um, but stay in your group. I have also heard that a few people didn't realize that they were assigned to a table. So um, if you haven't, if you just sort of randomly sat down somewhere, you may want to find your group. Um, those of you doing goals, strategies, and tactics will be in breakout rooms on the lower level of this building, right down the stairs or the elevator downstairs. There's big posters outside the rooms that tell you which room you are in. There will be, given all the questions we got this morning, 
On each table, there will be the sheet from the slide that parses out, this is what vision is, these are what goals are. So you will have that. And then you will have the questions much like you had um, this morning. One other thing to add is, in case you didn't figure it out or we didn't make it clear enough already, this first breakout session was for everybody to focus on mission. Because there was, that's the feedback we got early on, that everybody should have a chance to weigh in on mission because that's the critical foundational piece. Now we're going to cover all the other five elements in a strategic plan because our vision statement, our campus vision statement, does have all those elements as we discussed. Uh, so, uh, and I forgot what the point I was going to make now. Yeah. Okay, oh, um, so... Each one of you have an assignment uh, uh, in terms of one of those five, but we also recognize that some of you may want to discuss a topic, a category that you were not assigned. And so since we have um, a, a good um, long time for the second round of breakout sessions, um, we are going to, uh, what we suggest you do is after you've taken care of your primary assignment, whatever category is on your, uh, on your name tag, feel free to weigh in on the other categories if you have time available to do so. So if your group was assigned um, uh, vision, for example, and you, 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 you sort of covered that to your full satisfaction, go ahead and delve into goals or strategies or tactics if, you're, if, you, if you so choose. And all that information, again, should be uh, recorded in the notes so that uh, we can take advantage of that uh, for the benefit of the Strategic Planning Committee. Bonnie. One final note for recorders. Make sure your name is on the piece of paper, on all three, if you've lost your paper clip. And please leave those in the center of the table as you leave for lunch. We're going to gather up round one during lunch, and then you'll get another set of recording paper for the afternoon. So please, leave them on the table. And I don't know if you mentioned this already, but we are going to have, at every table there will be um, a hard copy of the definition of the various categories, because I know that some people wanted that as a reference, so you'll have that. All right. Okay, we are break for lunch. Thank you. I could have your attention for a moment. We're getting a lot of questions as to where you should be sitting. <laughs> if you can find your original table, that's preferable. If you went to a completely different group in the afternoon with different people, that's fine too. As long as the people who are doing the reporting out for the afternoon conversation know who they are, we're good. But if you can, get back to your original table from this morning. Thank you.
All right. I see most of us are back in the room. And now we're going to be doing our second round of reporting from the breakout discussions on vision, values, goals, strategies, and tactics. Now somebody, um, I forgot to mention this because somebody pointed out before we assembled today, they asked me the question, well, how are we supposed to evaluate strategies and tactics since they flow from the goals? And, uh, and so, you know, it's supposedly in the plan, you'll develop some goals, and then depending on what those are, the strategies will be chosen, and depending on what those are, the tactics will be chosen. And that was a good point. So my, my, uh, my way out of that bind was, <laughs> was to, to, um, to make the case that, you know, we are basically providing kind of raw input to the strategic planning uh, committee. And we're doing it from the perspective of the vision statement. So uh, we're certainly doing this on the vision and values in a way that's not, you know, sequential or hierarchical. But yes, with the other three, you're right. It, it sort of depends on what, what happens in each stage. However, the vision statement, as we saw, has all of these elements in it. And so in a, in a way, what we're doing is we're doing a, uh, uh, an assessment and providing input on on the elements that are present in the vision statement and sort of assembling them in different toolboxes so they become available to the strategic planning committee and to the you know and, and the feedback that people will eventually provide to what they produce um, clearly now we may have goals that are slightly different from uh, the goals that we can glean out of the vision statement. Um, but the vision statement has strategies, and so uh, that set of strategies can be kind of a, put in a strategies toolbox. And to the extent that strategic planning uh, can benefit from some of those strategies, they can pull those individual elements out of that toolbox and make them part of our new plan. Likewise with tactics. So the idea is to be clear about the, the category that each of these elements within the vision statement fit, and so it provides us a, a structural basis, a, a structured way to think about those elements and how, how much of a time frame uh, is associated with each of them. So, uh, and I know that all of you have had to figure out some way of coping with this little quandary uh, in your groups. And I already heard from one that basically said, well, we had a, a little trouble assessing the strategies until we came up with an additional goal. And we tacked on a goal, and then with that additional goal, yes, the strategies made sense. So that's one way to do it. Um, all of this input uh, that you're going to be providing in a minute is going to be very valuable, I think, uh, to the uh, Strategic Planning Committee. All right, so let's start then. We've got our uh, roving mic Folks out there, uh, Bonnie and Ronnie, we'll start with Bonnie. Okay, do we have any, do you want to go in order or just any topic, any time? We want to go through vision, values, goals, strategy, tactics, or not? Uh, good question. Yeah, let's, let's, let's do that. Let's start with vision. Okay, <laughs> who has something to say about the, <laughs> who has something to say about the vision? <laughs> tactics. Not the uh, vision, but <laughs> vision <laughs> elements. <laughs> okay, got it. All right, Ronnie's on his way over. Okay. Perfect. Okay, hi everyone, I'm Gabby Alberola, I'm with the School of Natural Sciences, and we talked about vision, and we wanted to make a comment about financing higher education. It is currently in the vision, but we didn't find anything that reflected that in the strategies or the goals, so we think that the strategies and goals should reflect that intention, and um, we talked about entrepreneurship as a potential strategy. Uh, we also think that the vision should include environmental sustainability. That was a top priority for everyone on our table. And uh, it should be more intentional about supporting all disciplines equitably. On that note, it should also include interdisciplinarity, uh, the terms interdisciplinary or interdisciplinarity somewhere in the, in the vision. Thank you. Thank you. Who 
who else who spoke about the vision wants to report out? This table's being really shy. Uh, I, I'm, I'm good here. Okay, here we, we got one here. Oh. Laura Lee Link, table nine. Um, our uh, vision group had uh, looked at all the bullets and then we said, well, we'll keep the bullets, but we had a, um, a kind of an intro. CSUMB, colon, an inspirational academic community committed to individual and societal transformation. She stole the comments from table 18. <laughs> she shared. Okay. <laughs> okay, here we go. Hi, I'm Channing, uh, and com coming from our table three. So we definitely picked through a lot of the bullet points a lot. We're not sure what we wanted to keep or if there was anything we wanted to keep. But we did think that the vision would, should articulate an aspiration to be a leader or premier institution for higher education in the region or state. So something in that way, um, we thought that was really important. And then we also felt that regional stewardship or uh, to be a regional steward should be a part of the vision. We also felt that there should be something about uh, inclusion of the co-curricular holistic learning of students and well-being of a whole campus community. So coming back to um, everyone in the community, not just the students, but uh, supporting everybody. Sorry, switch over here. And we, we along those lines, we want to suggest that the vision includes something about the learning and working community that we envision creating, and it would be more horizontal. So equity and respect would be according, will be accorded across social identities and differences, as well as across statuses and campus roles. Morning. Anyone else on the vision? I got one here. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Deb Burke, and I'm going to do my best to represent a really um, wild and fun ride of a conversation. Um, so w with the bullet points around the vision, um, I don't think there was any um, argument with what was bulleted. It was more an elaboration and expansion. Um, so I'm, gonna, I'm just going to take my time and hang out and free associate. <laughs> no, I'm not just kidding. Um, <laughs> Um, so related to service, there was um, more, more conversation about the recognition of our community members as co-educators, as honorary faculty, um, the importance of reciprocity and interdependence, um, and the, um, the relationship that we have with the community. Civic engagement was also discussed, and the importance of um, one of my colleagues um, talked about um, us um, cultivating the next generation of change makers and leaders. Um, as tied to civic engagement and through partnership with our community members. Um, related to the multicultural, gender equitable, um, multilingual piece, it was a, um, like a recommitment to that and understanding that um, gender equity has, um, has grown into something so profound and beautiful um, with non-binary identities and that led to um, conversation about queering the curriculum, um, queering our faculty, um, honoring the history, the commitment, the intellectual conversations of the LGBTQ plus um, community. Um, and then in terms of multicultural, um, our, um, in particular, communities that have been targeted by oppression, their contributions to knowledge, their um, rethinking, reimagining education, um, and making sure that our curriculum reflects a decolonized education to honor my colleague the other day, um, Jacinto Salazar. I don't know if he's here. Anyway. Um, we also um, talked about being a collaborative intellectual community and the interdisciplinarity was still vitally important. Um, being cross-departmental, inclusive teaching and learning for the whole person, recognizing that human beings come in with psychologies and bodies and spirits and that they have experienced oppression and are arriving on our campus and sometimes experiencing more. And so how do we organize and model ourselves in such a way that we are really doing things differently um, and, and are committed to um, healing and wholeness through um, teaching and learning and support. Um, let's see, 
uh, addressing oppression inequity that um, groups targeted by oppression historically and presently experience. Um, belonging and feeling valued, staff, faculty, and students feeling belonging and value as human beings here, valuing our community partners as well, both through us being in community with our partners and going out into our communities, but also inviting them to our campus more, honoring their knowledge and skills, and maybe even um, figuring out how to budget in such a way that we honor them with um, um, stipends and whatnot. Um, Okay, um, a commitment to the humanities, the arts, the language, and culture, and all of these are different ways to enter into academic content that support critical thinking um, and not losing that as we um, move forward. Um, also, we, we discussed technology and having a, a broader um, understanding of what the classroom means, and so having classroom spaces that happen on campus, but also thinking about classroom in um, the community surrounding the university, so more work in building satellite campuses and places and spaces. And then also thinking about um, virtual classrooms, hybrid classrooms, flipped classrooms, et cetera. Um, te technological literacy and also um, um, paying attention to the digital divide. There are students on our campus that don't have access to um, the information knowledge or the um, the tools that they would need um, to be a part of um, the, our technological speed and movement. And I think that's it. Okay, those are all very good feedback points. Uh, and, you know, we did ask you to, after doing the one assigned category, to take a look at all the other categories. Clearly, they looked at all the categories. <laughs> um, and, and so they're all valid points because you, you had that charge. What I'm going to ask you to do if you report is to identify uh, of the points that you're sharing with us, which ones were your insights on which category. So we know that, for example, I know that some of the things that were mentioned here clearly are tactics. I, I'm sure they knew they were tactics. But just label them that way. So we keep uh, a little, because that's one, one big point of this exercise is for us to be able to disaggregate the vision statement into these components. So it's important to, to label them properly. Thank you. Yes. OK, are we done with vision? All right. Then um, we'll move on to values. Miguel Lopez, a whole bunch of tables. I'm actually going to report out for all of the groups that did values. Um, we brought all of our, we, we did our work at individual tables, then we came back together, kind of did point counterpoint so that we wouldn't be repeating ourselves. Um, but we have a couple of framing um, points before I get to the values. Um, one is a question of how will all of this information get back to us, faculty, staff, administration, beyond just going to the strategic planning group. I know you're gonna talk later about that, but it, it's just a concern that came up. And particularly because how do students get involved in the, the engagement in all of these issues? We're doing a lot of work on behalf of students, but how do we make certain? Um, the second framing thing for the values was uh, going back to this morning's conversation about uh, the mission. Who is our audience? Because how we frame things internally within CSUMB and our own unique discourse as a particular campus might say one thing, and how we articulate that to the larger community might say another. Um, but we have to think about the particular language that we're using. Um, and particularly as we're thinking about that language, how do we maintain our uniqueness at CSUMB? That's the third point, so that we don't become a generic CSU or a generic UC or something. Um, but that's where our values should shine differently. And then third, because we believe that values inform the mission and everything else, that everything that was spoken of this morning in terms of mission has to somehow track back to a value. So we, if we've forgotten a value, but it was already kind of explicated in terms of a mission, help us remember things. So I'm gonna try the best I can to remember everything, but having said that. Um, the first value that we want to do is be committed to removing barriers that inhibit student success. And, and if I'm saying these and I'm saying them wrong, just throw a paper at me and I'll correct it. 
Um, second, that we want to be intentional about collaboration. That that's not just going to be something that's kind of said, but we're looking for ways to do that uh, across the student populations, across faculty, staff, student lines, et cetera, et cetera. Third value, that we have this balance between global perspectives and local initiatives. That we don't sacrifice one for the other, but that we look for that. Number four, that we are going to use different words and they may sound interchangeable, but the values group, we're making distinctions between is interdisciplinarity, collaboration, and partnerships. We saw those as related constructs where the Venn diagram had some overlapping, but that we saw those as different. And so we don't want to lose the particularity of all three of those. The next bullet point, number five, I believe I'm on, is foster a sense of community. Foster a sense of community amongst our students, amongst the faculty, amongst the staff, amongst the administration, and then within all of those groups. One of the words that came across from all the groups was the notion of wellness, sustainability. How do we sustain all of those people who are here? How do we do that in terms of all the way from the search committees all the way through? Particularly looking at how do we do internal development of faculty, staff, and administration, and students. So we're not just looking at that as the recruitment, but all the way through. That was a value. Um, the next value is community, once again, that we look at our community as a community, not just one that we serve, but one that can serve us because it has incredible richness and talent, expertise that we as a university can learn from. The next value is an explicit value of social justice. Articulated another way was this phrase, which we absolutely love, that we would embrace practices that actively disrupt injustice. So it does, we got the final language, just put it up on the website. Okay. Um, next bullet point, I forget what number I'm on, so someone help me out, but anyways. Um, that we have uh, socially responsible decision making. And one of the things that we wanted to do with that value is to recognize that there are many competing ethical values and we could create a list of a thousand of those, but that's what the larger umbrella was, was socially responsible decision making. Um, the next value is that we wanted to try and wrestle with um, the particular language that exists within the the vision statement as it is multilingual, multicultural, gender equitable learning. We recognize in the values group that there are groups that are not included in that. And so we want to find this balance as we continue to articulate our value language between having something that's just diverse but is so bland and ungeneric but also not wanting to make a list in which we would unintentionally exclude somebody simply by non-inclusion. But we did like this idea of naming very particular things like multilingualism, um, one area in which our campus could still continue to grow, uh, particularly in light of our Latino population, many of whom are Spanish speakers uh, as their native language. Um, Particularly one of the things that we were thinking about as that inclusion language is obviously immigration status in terms of the current realities that we face in a DACA generation that we have. Um, one of the things that we wanted to do was ask whether we needed to explicitly name teaching as a value. Um, I think it's implied in our statement, but who are we as a CSU with a particular mission to teach? And particularly, the, one of the ways that that was thought of is in the traditional four areas of the Boyer Scholarship to make certain that teaching remains a critical emphasis within that, but also because we're thinking about the connecting of the traditional academic and the co-curricular. So it's not just an RTP issue, but really looking at teaching across the campus as something central that everybody on the campus does, not just the faculty, not just student services, but everybody. Um, we were concerned about whether this is really a value or whether it is a tactic or strategy. Things like mentorship. Um, how do we mentor the valuable resources that we have and the people who are here? That that's both a value and a very particular strategy towards doing that. And service. 
that we wanted to name services of very particular value uh, in light of our university requirements as they stand, but also service on the campus, off the campus, need to be equally emphasized. And I believe I've done everything. Have I forgotten? What? Oh, I'm sorry. Shared governance. Am I good? Thank you. Barney, you've got somebody that, a group over there? So does anyone, anyone who was assigned to another topic, did your conversation go to values? Do you have anything other than the very comprehensive list we just got? <laughs> okay. And then we'll try goals then. <laughs> I'm going to let Ronnie get there first because yeah. he hasn't Ronnie. had one for a while. Good afternoon, Jennifer. Um, I was part of multiple tables, and what we came up is just going to be very basic and concise. We thought for the first bullet, we would focus primarily on these words accessible, diversity and inclusiveness, and enriched learning. The next bullet point, which was number two, we thought could pretty much stay as it was. For number three, we've added a word to this list of efficient and effective operation of the university. And what we've added is efficient ethical and effective operation of the university. For the fourth bullet, we chose or we decided that maybe since this was very wordy, to str strategize this would be extremely difficult. So to perhaps come up with a better focus is to perhaps choose two and focus on that. Or we did like how a lot of this, how these different things read, but they needed to be broken down a little bit more concisely in order for us to come up with something that we could work with strategically. And then for the fifth bullet, we really thought that it was redundant. It was redundant of number the bullet point number two and four. So we thought that perhaps we could just remove that one altogether. Dave, okay, thank you. Hello, I'm Megan O'Donnell. Um, ours is not concise, so I apologize. Um, and we're actually going in reverse order. Um, we're starting with number three of the goals question, uh, which was looking for components that were not present um, in the FVS. Um, and we had quite a few. Um, so first, uh, a goal would be that our leadership will always argue on behalf of our values and our vision. We also have a goal that we want CSUMB to be a leader in systematically assessing and eradicating racism and discrimination at our university and the broader community. We would also like to have as a goal that we as a campus will remediate or be remedy, equity, and competence that we will strengthen language requirements to support our mission of multilingual and equitable learning, that we will strengthen the teaching of cultural competence across all disciplines, that we will give a voice to our visionary community partners to strengthen our commitment to service learning, civic and community engagement, and professional development. And we also talked about a strategy or tactic that we could include, which would be that all students must engage in professional and social development through community partnerships. Um, to ensure that our students, staff, and faculty are supported holistically, focusing specifically on making sure that quality learning doesn't happen if food insecurity, precarity in the workplace, and home insecurity is present. Ensure that our faculty demographics are proportionate to student demographics so students see themselves reflected in the faculty. And then we also had specific revisions uh, going back to goals, question number one, um, we felt that there was actually an area in the vision that could be a goal, which is the multilingual, multicultural, gender, uh, equitable learning. Uh, we wanted to see that revised to include gender and racially equitable learning. 
um, and ensure that that was accessible to all, thinking for those students who are differently abled. Um, on page eight in the color-coded uh, um, uh, document that um, in the FES, uh, that it sh should be made a goal um, where it starts with the organizational structure, um, talking about how our university actually functions, um, that the organizational structure working to integrate the university community across staff, faculty, and administrative lines. And that we thought bullet number four in goals should be revised um, to include the following, that productive and engaged citizens and the social and civic responsibility and skills to be scholars and community builders. We also felt that bullet number four radically needed to, to be revised and strengthened in general, that there was an overemphasis on technical and trade skills. And we would like to see that balanced with the focus on um, humanity, fostering humanity in our students, uh, helping them become better leaders in their fields as well as in the broader community, to foster critical thinking and the capacity for lifelong learning that's going to evolve as they grow. Thank you. Uh, I'm Carly, and one discussion that our table had that sort of marries values and goals is um, about the equity not just of access, but the equity of outcomes, and how that's a value that, um, you know, I think all of American society could do a little bit better job of, of, of putting an uh, emphasis on not just that our doors are open, but that we have the services um, and the structure to actually support our students, especially those who are historically underrepresented or disadvantaged, um, to help those students, empower them, give them uh, the structure they need to complete their degrees and to go on and do great things. Um, so one of the goals, of course, is you know improving those six-year graduation rates and making sure that uh, we are doing everything we can to support our students in, in not just coming through the doors in the first place, but, but leaving as more prepared global citizens. So I'm Carl Ferguson, and uh, I'm going to just make a few personal points. And one is that we talked about equity, but Deb Burke did an incredible job of just uh, talking about equity, and we need to uh, uh, compliment and say that's where we needed to be with equity in our group. So thank you very much. Um, I also want to say that Miguel did a nice job of identifying values, but a lot of those were goals, and so I see us being able to use your values and think about goals. Um, our group talked a lot about the identification of goals that were measurable, so that may be something that we want to think about when we're creating goal statements. Um, we also wanted to make sure that we identified student success in a holistic manner, um, and that seems to be uh, something that we've already talked about. We did a lot of wordsmithing, so I'm not sure that it's really necessary that we kind of talk about those particular issues. We did have a tactic that came out of our work um, that dealt with affordable housing for students um, and making sure that we emphasized well-being, and I'll add my own personal uh, word to that, wellness, uh, and mindfulness uh, for our students um, before they leave and graduate. So, Hello, everyone. My name is Michelle Zarnecki. Um, and I'm going to start as well with question number three. We had a lot of things to add for goals. Um, so the first thing that we had was similar to some what other people were saying, um, creating conditions that support student success um, and making sure that we think about how we want to define that. Um, we talked about adding accountability as a goal. It's mentioned briefly in the vision statement, but there's not much description about that um, other than tying it into assessment. We talked a lot about student belonging, um, creating a community and an ecosystem where everyone feels inclusive, especially our commuter transfer and non-traditional students, um, as well as other underrepresented groups, and then building that into a strong alumni connection so that the alumni will want to come back and we create a, a larger sense of otter pride and otter community. 
um, and thinking about the whole student, so being holistic in that. We also said that we needed a goal for faculty and staff because as of right now, there's not one that specifically talks to them. Um, and then moving through some of the words, um, what we, the first, um, or the bullet point about meeting statewide and region -wide need, or regional needs. A lot of us talked earlier this morning about that belonging in the mission statement. Um, and we also talked about making the goals what we used as SMART, so specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time-specific, um, because right now they're pretty amorphous and it would be hard to evaluate. And so in writing those goals, using goal-specific language with strong power verbs. Hi, everybody. Dan Fernandez, and we also worked on goals, this table, plus others who are scattered around the room. Um, we, uh, starting with question number one, bullet number five, we uh, do agree that there's some redundancy with one of the other bullets, bullet two, but that we think that meeting crit critical state and regional needs is important, but should be in the mission statement rather than in a goal. We wanted to add in integration of university across staff and faculty lines perhaps add some sort of a goal around the graduation initiative, which would be probably more short-term than long-term. So we talked with some extens extensive conversations around breaking up short-term and long-term goals. Some discussion about rewarding these goals such that they were step-based, meaning um, that graduates can lead at local, regional, state, and global levels and kind of describe or within the goals distinguish between those steps, between those various levels. Add something about uh, the facilities and the footprint of, of, on, of the campus. Um, for instance, one, one of the phrases I had was creating a, we want a sustainable campus that fosters sustainable communities. And the idea of assessment also came up significantly. We need to be able to assess any of the goals that we establish. Also, investing in the physical environment and the uh, infrastructure for facilities. We even created a, a new word, maybe, or a new phrase. Emotional infrastructure, so the physical, social, cultural, and emotional infrastructure of the campus. Incorporate wellness as a foundation for every aspect of what we do. And everyone should be able to identify with all of the goals, so that there's not just goals for one group, or another group, but that the goals that we create encompass any group. They're general enough to do that. Increased access, so that on, on page two, increased access and quality learning should stay, but we need to add a retention element. Make a measurable component to quality education and alignment to AAC and U, perhaps, looking at that as far as the goals, more general. Adding something about renewal of goals periodically, so that we're not always necessarily doing the same goals, and that kind of blends in the short-term, long-term. Short-term would probably need to be renewed more frequently. Uh, sustainability and accessibility is part of the goal, investing in the physical environment. Emphasize the collaborative nature of our work and how uh, we do that, creating spaces for this and creating ways that, to make that happen. Here's a goal about growth. Uh, positioning to prepare instead of react to, to growing uh, student numbers through, um, a, and a strategy could be to utilize an equity plan, climate survey, and other equity assessments to guide the mission, vision, and values of CSUMB. Uh, financial advocacy and prepare in terms of the social, oh, I talked about the infrastructure already. And evaluate how impaction affects equity and access. Thank you. That was goals, right? Any other yeah. for goals? Okay. Um, strategies, groups that talked about strategies. <laughs> Angie's ready. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. 
So my name is Angie Tran, and I jumped ship. I was originally from table set 27, and I jumped to tw table 29. And the very reason is because of the bullet point number four or five is to seek partnerships across institutional boundaries. So I walk my talk. <laughs> so it's just so wonderful to be in the table with these wonderful participants. Uh, we had very vibrant uh, conversation, and um, I. I've been in the trenches of a classroom, and it's just so enlightening to hear experiences and stories from student services, from um, financial aid services, campus service center, student disabilities, world theater, the library, um, all the wonderful services. Without them, I cannot teach well. So, so with that, um, we, we look at these bullet points on strategies, and we are very mindful that these strategies should be informed by the mission, goals, and values of this university, not the other way around. So with that in mind, um, we're looking at very specifically the first thing that we say is that we really need to get interdisciplinarity into the mission. And it's sort of like music to my ears when I heard my colleagues talking about incorporating that into um, the, the vision, but we think that we would like to add that into the mission statement, just one word, onto the bullet point number two of the mission, which right now says high quality education. You can add that to the back of your card. Just one more word, high quality interdisciplinary education. Why I am such a, make such a big point about interdisciplinarity? Um, we've heard big time before the lunch about um, how interdisciplinarity helps students learn better, retain things better. But what about faculty? If we want to do it right, we really need to pay attention to bringing in different perspectives from different theoretical, methodological, even ideological perspectives, team teaching, and all of those things take time. So I really want to... Um, um, shed light on that, on that point. Um, and the second point is that we, f we found that the first bullet point under strategy is some, somewhat um, m misleading, enriched living and learning environment. It sounded to us like a goal, not a strategy. So we suggest to strike that out. Um, the second bullet point on um, building on regional assets in developing specialty clusters. We were scratching our heads and looking around, what, what does that mean? We look at, okay, so there's a long list of disciplinary areas that seem to us privileging some and missing others. So going back to our idea of the, 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 the strategies being informed by the, the mission and the vision of this university, we think that perhaps it is best to connect and reflect our values and mission. So we have this concrete suggestion to bring the subsequent four bullet points to elaborate on the specialty clusters, clusters, sorry, specialty cluster, uh, clusters instead of this long list of disciplines. For example, we say that building on regional assets in developing specialty clusters to reflect, to, to reflect one, interdisciplinarity, two, surface and reflection, Three, global interdependence. Four, language and cross-cultural competence. In a sense, we move the following four bullet points into special clusters. And we think that in thinking long-term, that would be best to connect and reflect our values and mission. Um, fourth, the idea of seeking partnerships across institutional boundaries are vague to us. So we were trying to understand what does that mean. Um, so among ourselves. That, you know, your reading of um, uh, partnerships across institutional boundaries makes, you know, makes a, a significant point. Just as a point of information, however, if you look at that fragment uh, of a sentence in, within the campus vision statement, it is talking about it in the context of partnerships with other institutions. That is the boundary between us and community colleges or, uh, or K-12 or what have you. So, because it goes on immediately after it says seeking partnerships across institutional boundaries, it mentions 
developing and implementing various arrangements for sharing courses, curriculum, faculty, students, and facilities with other institutions, which I actually put as a tactic because they got very specific, and the, the seeking partnership would be more along the lines of a strategy. So, uh, but this just shows that the, the, the act of engaging with this uh, campus vision statement can trigger additional thoughts and add more to the conversation. So it's all good. Next group. Yes. Hi, I'm Enid Rice. We worked with strategies. I'm feeling a little nervous that I'll remember to say everything correctly. Um, the first thing we did was look to goals because strategies are inextricably linked to goals. Uh, goals, we, would, we talked about adding, um, adding a public engagement, public service, and a sense of the value of being a public institution versus a private institution. Um, and that we want students to face the challenges of a dynamic and changing economy by employing creative approaches uh, to their disciplines. Um, also, uh, relating to goals, um, engaging beyond the boundaries of the university, as just as you were just saying, um, to communities, campus, non-campus uh, community. And a good suggestion from a former student who's a staff member at our table was a tactic, like what happens to the students on the weekends? Um, thinking about that. Um, so let's see. Um, also, we looked at um, adding integrated and experimental use of technologies as a strategy uh, and integrate modern learning technology and pedagogy, taking it out of tactics because we didn't feel it was as granular, although it uses technical as a word. It's not that technical, so it may be more of a strategy than a tactic. Um, we talked about the strategic language um, looking at, you know, these bullet points, which are taken out of context, but they, the framing uh, verbs are no verb, and then integrate, invest, seek, recognize, and respond. And we thought that perhaps recognize wasn't a good strategy word. Um, so thinking about, you know, strong, powerful verbiage, like invest is one. Um, that it should be framed consistently and reflect the level of engagement we have with, with each bullet point. Um, we thought we could integrate the phrase, uh, uh, update the phrase, integrate work and learning, uh, maybe update it to talk more about uh, high impact practices that we have demonstrated that we do well, looking at actual data. Um, and then question number three, what's missing? We got kind of big picture. Um, the first thing we thought needs to be added is underserved students and increasing access for underserved students. Um, we wanted to add language around critical thinking and creativity. Um, we wanted to add tactics around accessibility for all students despite mental and physical abilities and a holistic approach to an enriched learning environment. Uh, interweaving the goal of sustainability throughout the document. A tactic we thought might be important and given the last election would be cyber, cyber, cyber civics and media literacy. Uh, do they have a place in general education? This is something I ask myself quite a bit lately. Um, and a goal of nutritional security for every student. Um, a value of global perspectives in pursuit of supporting the diverse peoples of California. And um, something uh, important that we thought should be stated explicitly, um, that we are engaged in social justice, economic justice, engaging and confronting all systems of oppression. Thank you. Hi, um, Hallie Farley, Student Housing and Residential Life, represent. Um, <laughs> we um, ended up delving into each of the bullet points to kind of break down what we felt that it meant, uh, other than just seeing um, if it really applied to being a strategy. So um, some of the things that we had ad addressed with the enriched living and learning environment, we wanted to refocus some of the language of these um, because it was a, just a little bit confusing or at least ambiguous. What does that mean, enriched? So um, some of the information that we, some of the changes that we thought would be good for that is uh, instead of enriched living and learning environment, maybe to build, develop, and expand living and learning environment, that way we bring a little bit more focus into what is a living and learning environment and what it is that we want it to look like. Um, 
also we ended up getting a little bit into how we could revise some of the language to reflect more of the um, current colleges and programs application to regional assets. So uh, on a wide scale, what are all of these uh, colleges um, being reflected from our standpoint, our strategies, and are we really focusing in on um, a cohesive unit um, all around? That also kind of got into the, pardon me, it also got into bullet point two with the building on regional aspects in developing specialty clusters. That looked a little bit wordy for us as well. So um, maybe a little bit more focus into, do you mean regional aspect, uh, assets as far as our environment? Do you mean uh, as far as what, the, um, what we have socially to uh, support us in um, the assets, meaning that uh, social service, um, groups and programs that uh, geared more towards um, what they call underprivileged or uh, underdeveloped communities uh, to foster learning. Um, also, we touched a little bit on um, what ended up being more like tactics to one of the bullet points, which had to do with the last one, responding to historical and changing conditions, experiment, experimenting with strategies, which increase access, improve quality, and lower costs. Um, the way that we were thinking on a method to lower costs is with our housing to provide a little bit more options for um, che cheaper housing. Uh, we fostered a little bit of the uh, language saying Disneyland housing, that some of uh, the housing options are a little bit more flowerly, floral, floral um, a little bit more the bells and whistles. Uh, what I used was Hollywood. So um, maybe getting back to some more um, cleaner, concise and simpler standards, maybe um, tactics being uh, more dormitory style, uh, smaller, uh, also uh, focusing on cooking options. A lot of students on campus, they'll have this kitchen, kitchenette set up, but are they really knowing how to foster their nutrition? Are they really being able to balance out what they're eating and um, focus it toward a more nutritional um, outset for themselves? So um, it did get a little bit into the tactics side of things, but it really came from the fact that some of this language is a little bit ambiguous and some language that we would want to add into it, for example, with um, invest in languages and cross-cultural competencies. Um, instead, uh, oh boy, pardon me. <laughs> instead, maybe building out opportunities for international studies, building out opportunities for additional language learning. Um, some examples were for uh, American Sign Language and French. Uh, that could be attached to maybe um, review some of our language courses and delve deep to see if we're actually touching into uh, the various uh, languages that are actually being utilized in both business and uh, education worldwide. Um, another little bit of language that we thought uh, would be, um, would build upon what we're thinking for strategies is the seeking par partnerships across institutional boundaries. Um, what about seeking partnerships within and across institutional boundaries? Uh, also, not just institutional boundaries, international boundaries as well. Are we really connecting with the uh, international uh, environment within the institution that we are trying to build. So it, um, we ended up breaking down a good deal of what this language really means, what it is that we're trying to say. And um, another big thing that was pointed out is some language like professional training. Um, is that actually being utilized today? Is that still uh, a phrasing that we're using? Or is it now uh, outdated and uh, a, a bit 
lack of phrasing, a little bit old for the new age that we're trying to build now. Uh, what's, what's the thing? Okay, all right, that was it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, my team focused, uh, there was a bunch of us. Um, I'm Susie Worcester, School of Natural Sciences. Um, we revised that first bullet that's already been discussed, enrich living learning environments instead to fit with the goals in the morning. Um, enrich living learning and work environments to address the whole person. And underneath that, we discussed a variety of things. We included affordable housing for faculty, staff, and students, which used to be on the master plan. and is not so much, at least for faculty and staff. Um, access for uh, faculty and staff to gyms, wellness center, other types of opportunities. Access to the charter school. Um, affordable childcare for staff, faculty, and students on campus being part of having that whole student, whole faculty. Um, since we're moving toward more evening classes, um, that's an issue with the daycare. It's also an issue with student services and thinking about that, about the whole person. Um, another one related to that for the whole student is making sure we have adequate support for student services such as health and wellness, mental health, and fully funding SDR, the student disability resources to provide the staff, staff support to fully meet the needs of our students. Um, so that was all under that first bullet. We spent a lot of time on that one. Um, the other ones we focused on, um, the partnerships. There was um, a big discussion about um, uh, really focusing on what we're already doing well, best learning practices through service learning, internships, real world experiences. Um, and many uh, programs are doing this to make our students really well uh, prepared. But that's not necessarily in these long term documents and planning goals. And, and I think we should put that in. Um, supporting faculty as researchers, no, bullet eight, let's see, that's our last one. Oh, that historical changing conditions, da 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 da, that is somewhat problematic. We uh, suggested that we need to make sure that we support faculty as researchers and good teaching, that we should use the word innovation in that, and innovation should be a key word, and that that needs to be supported um, throughout, um, because it's uh, challenging, but it's a key element that we do well. Um, and notice I'm going between strategies and tactics and up to goals a little bit. Um, I apologize. Let me flip over. Um, there's that, our number two is all this building on regional assets that went into a long list of stuff. We had a lot of discussion of and some specific details of words to remove, but I think everybody thought that was a little problematic. Um, so I don't think I'll read that all out. Um, we did think it was important to pull out specific what we called ILO concepts, or um, I, I think I can coin that, but um, integrated learning uh, concepts such as having um, information literacy, um, this media literacy, and, and some of these elements should be in, as part of that goal or that uh, strate strategy as written. We also thought it was important that social justice be written throughout, because again, that was brought up in the morning, and yet it wasn't actually reflected in any of these. Um, and similarly, sustainability, environmental, personal, and economic sustainability was brought up in the morning and is not reflected throughout these. Um, and we also thought there should be a new bullet, um, and maybe this is what the uh, partnerships is intended to be, but really um, strongly linking with community colleges and K through 12 schools. We discussed in our group that there's a strong piece in the Department of Education group, um, uh, but, um, or the College of Education, but there's many ways it could be all the way across campuses, including making links to some of the high schools in the area that we currently don't um, connect with well, um, and making that broader, as well as our service learning missions. So really making that a fundamental aspect. Did I do a good job? Okay. We got a continuation. Hold on a second. Well, it's a different table. We kind of uh, dispersed and then regrouped at the same table. Um, but we, um, our group shared some of the same concerns that have been expressed earlier, um, specifically about the enriched learning uh, or living and learning. 
um, concerns about um, extending that to our commuter students, our extended education students, and some of the, the broader communities that are not gonna be living in a residence hall um, or on campus. Um, we wanted to make sure that those opportunities for them, um, those benefits, would be able to be accessible as well. Um, we had some concerns similarly about the specialty clusters. Um, that particular phrase seemed to conflict a little bit with our goals for integration and um, you know, co-curricular, intercurricular learning, and we wanted to make sure that we were not um, pursuing a direction that was more um, into silos based by major or college, that we were still um, being true to those priorities we have um, across the campus and across um, education. We just feel that that is really important to our identity as a university. Um, we also had some concerns about, you know, we um, want to have support for our, our underserved populations, but how well are we meeting those needs once they're actually on campus? Um, how are we helping them through, especially first generation students who are navigating a completely foreign culture, policy, bureaucracy, and making sure that we have those needs? Do we have adequate advising? Do we have adequate access to faculty for career coaching? Do we, are we putting the resources behind our goals? Um, are we making sure that we're, our resources are allocated um, appropriately? And we also discuss the need as a strategy to use data to guide our decisions. Um, we do have a lot of data. Are we using it? Are we effectively um, using that to evaluate where we are now and where we want to lead in the future and whether the funding and the resources are there to um, succeed and execute on our goals? Um, we felt that that was really critical and that there are many good ideas and good intentions out there that don't fully and have not historically fully served our students to the best of its potential. Um, we want to also make sure that we're measuring our outcomes once we have students here, how effective are they being in the university environment and how effective are they being once they leave? Are they spending so much time, effort, money, and passion into something and they're not able to succeed once they leave our nest? Um, we want to make sure that we're, our outcomes long term are supporting our students as well. Um, we want to make sure that we're removing barriers for students. So if we are losing, if we're looking at our attrition, what is the reason we're losing students? Is it financial? Is it something, a small fee? Maybe they have a $500 balance. Um, could there be financial support programs, you know, sponsor a student? Um, if there are small ways that are not um, traditionally considered that we can retain and support um, especially our most um, fragile or needy students um, to succeed, if some small other ways that we could do to be more innovative to support them. Um, and we just want to make sure that um, we're smart about where we're going forward and that we are fully supporting um, all of these amazing ideas that we have with the data and the resources to truly execute where we're going. Thank you. This is still strategies? Yes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Let's make this the last strategy, then we'll go to tactics. We do have a little extra time because we won't take 30 minutes for the closing remarks. Go ahead. Okay, my name is Fred Watson. Um, in, uh, by the time you get down to strategies after pulling apart a document like this, you, you kind of end up with these fragments that, uh, that don't sit particularly well together um, in terms of being phrased consistently and um, w without the context that they, they were originally drawn from. So we thought that at the outset, one thing you might want to do is, is attempt to rephrase everything, not necessarily change the concepts, but rephrase it to have a consistent um, structure. You might use a language like invest in infrastructure, that, dot, dot, dot. Invest in faculty and staff, that, dot, dot, dot. Invest in research. Um, as well as the other concepts that are already there. Then uh, when we started to pull apart the individual concepts, we also uh, unpacked the enriched living and learning environment piece. We tried to come up with a statement that kind of reinterpreted that a little bit, particularly with respect to the campus living environment. And we thought, provide a campus environment that facilitates holistic, inclusive activities supporting wellness and learning of the whole student. Um, that could obviously be wordsmithed a lot, but that was an attempt to, to really unpack that enriched living component. 
we uh, looked at the second bullet, which is the, the really long one with lots of different uh, areas and, and the, the mention of specialty clusters. We thought that specialty clusters was a concept that was uh, pretty, uh, a bit of a buzzword 20 years ago, but hasn't really survived. Um, and we, we've kind of, we now have a set of academic programs and inter interdisciplinarities that ha have different names and um, a different uh, organization. So maybe just the word academic programs is the way to go there. So building on regional assets and developing academic programs such as dot, dot, dot. And then if you start pulling apart those words, I represent the science, sciences and I can easily see one word we could probably scratch, which is atmospheric. We, we don't really emphasize, emphasize atmospheric sciences anymore. I imagine that other programs could also uh, you know, rephrase some of those words. Um, when it comes to building on regional assets, uh, we thought assets and needs. What does our region need? We should serve that and, and see that need. That is probably everything that hasn't already been said. So now we will take uh, uh, reports from uh, groups that focused on tactics. Here we go. Hello. Um, so I will try and be brief and maybe just take some highlights out of what we discussed, because we discussed a lot. Um, the tactics seemed to um, meld the pedagogy and technology, and we thought that maybe that those should be distinct. Um, in particular, in terms of the pedagogical approaches, it could include language along the lines of asset-based asset pedagogy and learning centered around students' lived experiences. Um, and then we had a lot in terms of question three about what we could add. In particular, uh, we could possibly, one of the tactics was year-round operations. And so offering more summer classes to support year-round operations. And then in line with that, providing provision or provisions of support services, including groceries, postal service, bank, advising year-round. Um, we also included a bullet on institutionalized funding support for student services and programs that represent underserved URM uh, minoritized populations. Um, as well as matching curricular pathways to course offerings, uh, providing training for faculty, staff, administration, students for asset-based, uh, culturally-based pedagogy, as well as establishing alumni chapters at each level and maintaining a database of local alumni. So those were things that we thought we could add to the tactics. Uh, Andrew Porteous, I'll try and be quick. Uh, tactic number one, we just we just struck through it, uh, year-round operation, we just got rid of it. Uh, tactic number two, uh, we rephrased it to say leverage, leverage, sorry, uh, technology to support community building and efficiency in the workplace and classroom and residential life. Tactic six, uh, we did using an assessment of results to inform future plans and practices. And then we had a lot of discussion around the others, which I won't bore you with, but thank you. Hello. Oh, that was very loud. Is this an okay volume? Yeah. Yes. Okay, hi again. I'm Kristen Vega. And uh, we went rogue and really focused on number three, what we could add. Um, and so these are, uh, yeah, do with them what you will. Okay. So. Um, Unfortunately, cash money is really important, and so we are really thinking about ways to share costs and resources with other CSUs. Um, and also, uh, we this whole day has made me realize that I am just a small slice in the large CSU and B pie, and somewhere some student somehow needs your services. And so, if this is already happening, and but we just don't know about it, like please holler or something so that way we know. Um, okay, so if that's already happening, great. Let's make it better. Um, we're really looking to uh, collaborate with regional um, companies or nonprofits or just general partners to influence uh, curriculum development and some internships and uh, really focus on a degree to job pi pipeline or degree to additional, um, additional 
degrees, whatever that looks like, um, really involve students in town and gown and development opportunities, um, and or even staff who work more at the ground level, at a coordinator level, who know what students are doing day in and day out, to really put a face to the donations, because again, we need some money. Um, and then really streamline, okay, help me out, asynchro, Greg Poole, asynchronous, there we go. That's a, that's a big word. Um, effective communication avenues and perhaps uh, really push a, a one campus app that would, uh, that's where students are and that's where uh, we can be. Uh, I don't know a lot, a lot about technology, but it's a, okay, he's shaking his head, Greg Poole, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> Develop more cross-campus spaces like this retreat. Um, I hope when more student uh, buildings are open up, we'll have more third spaces where we can stand in a food line next to a faculty member and strike up conversations. Um, a, a lot more learning series where we are talking with each other face to face. Um, and that was really to, uh, so much can happen. Like just in this day, if you only take away one new relationship, that's huge. Um, and really create, um, implement curricular and co-curricular learning outcomes and feedback loops. Uh, uh, I think we discussed over at Table 30 data-driven uh, practices. Let's do it. Yeah, thank you. Hi, my name is Sydney. I'm with our staff with the School of Computing and Design, and I'm going to speak that the best of my ability for the people who took over Table 28 as the rebels without a cause. Uh, so we went into um, more as like an editorial suggestion for the tactics that they should be more explicit in their action and that we need to define the pedagogy there. Uh, we also thought of merging the second through fourth bullet points under tactics. We thought that those were pretty repetitive within themselves. Um, we were, spoke a lot about infrastructure and that we need to articulate the clear infrastructure and make a campus-wide evaluation of our resources and the successes and failures of each of those resources or services and um, take inventory essentially of what's working, what's not, and build from there. Uh, we also wanted to define the um, student body as both current students and then also future students that are in our Tri-County area that are looking to our classes and that are looking to go to CSUMB but need just a little bit of help along the way and understanding what services we have available to offer them. Uh, we also wanted to um, support commuter students and really build the infrastructure to highlight the service that uh, faculty, staff, and students can all come together to help make students more leaders in the community and also to help make, you know, and continue staff and faculty to be leaders as well. Um, and to build the infrastructure to have uh, students be encouraged to be socially interactive and um, really take into the um, social classes that we could um, make as a mandatory requirement for them and just make them uh, socially aware of what's going on in their community and their global environment. And um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Hello, I'm Adrienne Saxton, and our group um, kind of went carte blanche as well with this tactics because we didn't know the strategies or the goals that could be leading to our tactics. So we um, did a move some things and left others, but the three kind of components that we, we categorized for tactics were basically investment. Right, so needing to um, strategically invest uh, resources on campus into places like professional development, like research and support for faculty scholarship, for you know um, social, social like providing opportunities for social justice concepts to be learned and taught at all levels, staff, faculty, um, you know, and leadership, admin. Uh, uh, so that social justice concepts are understood across the curriculum. That the interdisciplinary, um, you know, we need to be able to invest in opportunities to um, collaborate in, uh, interdisciplinary, both within a campus community, but then also outside of our community with other campuses and with um, 
or of organizations outside like our health departments and hospitals and so on and so forth, maybe for internship opportunities, for example, but also um, service learning experiences and professional development as well, right? So that we can share that piece. Um, that the other kind of strat or tactic that uh, we basically identified with on top of investment in and, and strategically investing uh, in resources is to um, find ways to share resources uh, through those collaborative opportunities like cost sharing, um, like MOUs within, once again, our, uh, our institution, but then outside of our institution as well. Um, let's see, once again, um, sorry, oh, really important to the, the process of tactics understanding our tactics was to be able to identify and address the barriers to interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary institutional collaboration, and then create those processes that are streamlined that allow for us to um, find the time, the space, and the money to be able to um, do those things. Uh, the final piece is just really finding ways to creatively engage um, both within uh, the, the um, institution and then outside of our institution so that um, we can provide um, holistic programs once again at all levels, students, faculty, up to admin. Um, also finding ways to creatively engage our community with outreach and awareness of the programs and services that we do offer here on campus um, and then within our campus community as well so that people know all of the programs that are available. Um, and then also as far as assessment um, uh, and outcomes, we are also talking about um, really including the community in conversations regularly. Uh, that's, once again, within the university and our institution and also without, or outside, sorry. Yeah. Thank you. Hello again. Oh my, that was laughter, that's a little frightening. Um, so we took, uh, we ended up pulling together a number of goals and tactics and we have a number of other tactics that now fit under a bunch of other um, umbrellas. So under enriched living and learning with a smattering of the integration of technologies and pedagogies and a bit of language and cross-cultural experiences, um, the, the group noted that um, we want to make accessible education to the breadth of the students we have. So, and that includes the enriched learning experience, living and learning experiences. How do we touch then our commuters? How do we touch our non-traditional adults for whom the traditional living and learning or traditional on-campus experiences may not be as accessible as we'd like them? To that end, removing structural barriers for these student groups and others to give them better access to study abroad and other kinds of internationalization opportunities, realizing that not all of them can engage in study abroad, and how do we make it so that more of them can. Uh, so that the, the tactics remain to be seen. Most of those are goals, as you'll note. Um, but to remove structural barriers and also to expand team teaching opportunities, year-round operations, including summer and evening and the word weekend might have come up in conversations. <clears throat> and related to that, the expansion of student support services to cover whatever of those tactics for year-round operations we choose to follow. The integration of technology, including the develop professional development and um, learning development for students, staff, faculty, admin, uh, as the situations have, as one person put it, changed since 1994, <laughs> and that perhaps we need to take that into account. And our group wanted to leave with something that was not left in bold, but wanted to highlight the part of the founding vision statement that uh, begins with a pluralistic academic community where all learn and teach one another in an atmosphere of mutual respect and the pursuit of excellence. And we can think of no other goal, 
strategy or tactic that is more important than mutual respect. Actually, I think that's a value, <laughs> but... <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, that's it, right? Yeah, I think uh, uh, that's wonderful. Um, thank you so much for this feedback. Uh, this time, the reports were a little more expansive, but understandably so, because we were working with multiple categories. So I really appreciate uh, the work that you've done. Uh, I'm, I'm very gratified by the way the day has gone. I think that uh, it's really... I, I, I'm not surprised, though. I had complete faith that you would...